Good morning. We have a quorum yet? I think we're one away, if I'm counting correctly. I'm counting five. Done. We don't have a quorum yet. Members of the public, we're going to wait just a moment here before we begin because we are looking for a quorum take at least one more member to join us. Uh, yeah, um, let's see, call somebody. There's Donna. Yeah, I hit the nine, I hit the nine three link at first. Okay. Nick Aurelio. We're good. A little bit early. Okay, we're going to start then, uh, even though we're short folks. Um, <clears throat> probably by the time we get to important items, we'll have the people we need. So good morning, everybody, members of the public, members of the board, staff, uh, other consultants and others. Um, we're opening the August 28th, 2020 meeting of the Metropolitan Transit District meeting. Um, and I'll ask um, for a roll call, please. Remember to unmute yourself when you get called. Well, we're doing the tag team again, so we don't have the echo on this end. So, roll call. Director Bator. Here. Director Kaufman Gomez. Director Gonzalez. Here. Director Leopold. Here. Director Lind. Here. Director Matthews. Director McPherson. Director Myers. <laughs> Here. Thank you. Director Pegler. Here. Director Rothwell. Director Rotkin. Here. We have form. All right. Thank you. Well, we'll begin. We have um, a Netflix announcement. Today's meeting is being broadcast by Community Television of Santa Cruz County. Um, and let's see. Our first item is uh, any comments from members of the board of directors on items not on today's agenda. Anyone have a comment for us? I do. Yes, no. Donna, go ahead. Just um, to Gina to. Uh, thank you. You know, um, where our hearts are with you and uh, just thank you for being there and being who you are and we're here to support you. Thank you. Sure you're speaking. She says, uh, she says, she says, she says, thank you, Donna. And don't make her cry. And don't make her cry. And Mike, I, I, Mike, I just also wanted to, to also let you know, Donna, we're, yeah, I mean, Gina, we're thinking about you and um, please let us know how we can help. And I just also want to thank everyone at Metro, all the drivers, everyone that's been working hard to help all the evacuees and um, just extremely proud of, of, the, uh, of the organization and what you've done over the last week and a half to uh, really help our whole community. So thank you to everybody. You're here. And welcome home, Alex. Hey, thank you for that welcome as I was pulling into Scotts Valley uh, yesterday evening. Uh, it, was cool. the best, it was the best part of the last 10 days for sure. <laughs> that was cool. Now we got to hope for the rest of the folks uh, points beyond. Yes. It sounds like they're going to probably open up Felton pretty soon, maybe the next Yeah. yeah. Really, uh, welcome back. Um, up oh. after your experience it's all good to see you folks i'm still dealing with a little bit of uh residual from the the effects uh so it'll probably be with me a couple of months more but um i'm here and i'm happy to see all your smiling faces uh even though the world seems to be collapsing in front of us and before us and after us um i think our resilience as a community has uh just shined forward and uh my heart goes out to Gina and all those that have lost their homes and any possessions that you know are not replaceable. Yeah. Um, so again, I thank you guys folks and I thank your, everybody for your resilience. And I know it was probably pretty hard for Bruce to leave his house, um, but um, we should all be going, rolling back. 
Yes, right. Bruce is welcomed home as well. You're here. Okay, we have two written communications. The first one um, is from Christina Grant Granados uh, regarding the 2020 census. So this is important for us, for members of the public who might be on this call. I'm sure the board members are aware of this, but a bunch of our fundings depended upon the population count, which is directly related to the census that we're doing. So it's really important that people fill out the census and we get a complete count from our county because it really will make a difference in the funding that we get and the service we can provide to the public. So that's a, we appreciate that. And that comments in the board packet for those who have access to it that tells you by with a single click, you can get to the form you need to complete the census, which will be helpful. Secondly, um, we got a letter from the MAC that uh, Veronica Elsie wrote to us on behalf of the MAC, thanking us for the emergency services that the uh, district has provided to the public and the, the, the uh, comment that Donna had made earlier and, and Aurelio as well. Um, so th and that's, uh, we appreciate that, that letter and uh, that they're on top of what's going on there. Um, next, um, we have uh, labor organization communications. This is for items not on today's agenda. Are there comments from the labor organizations this morning? And I'll leave it to someone to find out who's online to give us those comments. Let's see, there's a hand, Mike. Let me just see if I can find it. Uh, Joan Jeffries. Joan, go ahead. Good morning. Make sure to unmute yourself. Joan, you're hearing me? Our mic is still showing as muted. Oh, okay, you can you hear me now? Now we, we do. Hear. Thank you. Yes. Okay, great. Thank you. This is a different format than we've done before. So, yes, thank you. Good morning, Board of Directors. Um, I wanted to just make a brief comment about a, a planned relocation of our accessibility services coordinator, John Doherty, to a different facility. And I understand that John has a lot of concerns about this relocation. I just want to say that as his union representative, as an SEIU representative, we support John and his concerns about this move. And we do feel that more review had been given the impacts of this move before this move takes place, um, both review with John and with his union representatives and with the community members that John serves, the impacts to them as well, uh, so that any concerns could be alleviated prior to this move taking place. And that's the end of my comment. Thank you. Thanks for the comment, Joe. Let me ask Alex to tell us briefly what, uh, give some little background detail for the board members who are unaware of what's going on. Sure, it, it is a personnel matter, so I don't want to uh, go into detail about that, uh, please, but, I will say that we did receive the letter from the Commission on Disabilities. Uh, we want to acknowledge receipt. Uh, we don't have it published as of yet because it came after the posting of the agenda. Um, and we have uh, uh, received that and um, we will look at their concerns, but uh, I can assure you that nothing in this move should in any way impact Mr. Doherty's ability to continue to serve the ADA community well as he has in the past. Uh, and it actually helps him better accomplish his newer tasks, which are to help us migrate our existing paratransit qualified riders over to our new Ecolane app. Um, and that new Ecolane app um, will, allows customers to both pay their fare via the phone app and to, to, um, to, to book their ride. So it's a really important project He's been tasked with that. Uh, there'll be a lot of work. He's been trained on that, as a matter of fact. There'll be a lot of work to do in that endeavor. And at some point, if Pacific Station ever reopens, um, there, there might be uh, more things to do over there. But we're confident it will not impact his ability to continue to serve the ADA community well. Thank you. Alex. Are there other uh, labor organization communications this morning? Looking, I don't see any hands. Uh, All right, I think not. 
I'm going to say under these extraordinary conditions, if there's a comment later, I'll be willing to entertain that. Hand raise, Mike. Who's, who's hand is up? Brenda Gutierrez. I'm sorry, I can't hear you, Ed. Brenda Gutierrez has her hand raised. Brenda, go ahead. Please unmute yourself. Hello, good morning. My name is Brenda. I'm not sure everyone can hear me fine. Yeah, a little louder would be good. We can hear you though. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so my name is Brenda. I'm the commissioner, vice chair of the Commission on Disabilities. Uh, we were the ones that sent in the letter in regards to the move of the office of John Doherty. Uh, we wanted to just uh, express our concerns about the move. Um, like, like I said, John Doherty told us about what was going on. Uh, he reports regularly to us to metro related matters. And uh, he told us that he was being relocated to a research park this way on Soquel Avenue. And this raised some concerns for us as a commission. Uh, pre pandemic, he typically provided in person accessibility services to approximately 30 clients per month at a centrally located area, which is Pacific Avenue. On average, at least half of those clients used mobility devices. So presumably, if the accessibility services office is relocated to Research Park, many of these clients would have additional uh, barriers to make it to that new office. Uh, all our clients require uh, travel challenges. Uh, so they require buses or paracruises. And so uh, it poses a lot of difficulty getting there because that is not a very safe area for people in wheelchairs. Uh, there is currently no sidewalk on that area, as well as it's a hazard to cross streets. So that's basically our concern about the relocation. So we would like to request that the decision is postponed until a proper study can be conducted and community input can be considered to ascertain what impact the move could have on the disabilities community in order to gain a better understanding of the context in which the move was proposed. We would also be interested to learn of any contributing factors which may be a benefit to the public. Thank you so much for your time. Okay, thank you for your comments. I will note that that's on a major, there are many bus lines that run right by that uh, address. There's a nearby bus stop. I'll leave it to uh, Alex again to work out this, this matter, um, the concerns about the ac access for the, the uh, members of the public that might need to get to his office. I understand that we, and we understand there are quite a few people that do that regularly. Any other, that's actually a general comment from the public. Any other labor communications? I don't see any. Any comments from the general public on items that are not on today's agenda? I'm not seeing any hands. Sorry, Mike, uh, I'm, I'm slow here on the uptick. Uh, Deb Molina. Say it again. Deb Molina. Thank you. Deb, please go ahead. Make sure you're unmuted. Yes, good morning. Good morning, Deb. Um, I, I'd like to talk about the train and the trail that the RTC is pushing okay. and how it will and how it will impact the metro bus lines. I'm opposed to the train because it doesn't get people where they need to go. The metro, on the other hand, has the ability to take people directly to their destination, whether it's UCSC, Cabrillo, Dominican, or areas in South County. The train could only go one way on the single track, so it would never be an efficient way to commute. The bus allows for multiple routes being run all over the county simultaneously. The bus already has existing infrastructure, which could be helped by having a lane dedicated to buses on Highway 1. Bus routes are flexible and can be changed as needed versus a train track that has zero flexibility. The bus is cost efficient and saves tax dollars. But my single greatest concern for the Metro, if the RTC continues to push their train, is that more money will be taken from limited transportation dollars to pay for endless studies and an inefficient train. The Metro already has a bare bones budget and will have to cut routes further to pay for a train to nowhere. 
please make sure the RTC doesn't cut the one cost effective and efficient transportation option already in place to build their boondoggle train. Thank you. Thanks for your comments, Deb. I'm gonna point out, I'm on the alternatives committee that's studying the question. And right now we're, we are still studying four possible modes uh, for, for a public transit on that corridor. And they include both bus, two bus options and two train options. And the RTC has not made a decision in, in favor of a train at this point, neither the staff nor the, the board itself. And so that's a decision that's still ahead of us. And uh, the comments you've made are appropriate to that. And we'll make sure that those are forwarded to that committee so that they get your comments along with others that we've been receiving. But that's not a decision that's been made. The RTC is not pushing for a train. They're trying to study whether a train or a bus or, or what kind of train or what kind of bus might make the most sense along that route. Thank you for your comments. Are there other comments from the public on items not on today's agenda? Looking, looking, don't see any hands. Wait just a moment. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> Uh, we don't have any comments from the MAC this morning, uh, written comments other than the one we already got, uh, mentioned from uh, 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 in relation to the emergency services. The next item on our agenda is our consent agenda. These are the items under number nine, they go through 914. And these are items that we're going to take in a single motion all together, unless somebody on the board believes that we should pull one off for further discussion, or if somebody has a brief comment that's appropriate right now. Let me ask if there are any items that board members would like pulled from the consent agenda or brief comments on the consent agenda. Who's yeah. thanks, thanks, Mike. Uh, I, um, I think on item number 910, the, um, on the ridership reports, I think that would be better discussed under, uh, in, in uh, cooperation or um, with uh, items number 13 or 14 about the rider survey and the fiscal crisis report. I think we should, uh, I'd like to pull that and have that in, uh, be involved in the discussions of, of those two issues, uh, items number uh, 13 and 14. Let's, let's then make this item number 12.5 uh, on our agenda. We'll move it to there. If it, unless Mr. Chair. Objection. Mr. Chair? Yes. Just one, one correction. I, I believe it was announced as 910. I think it is 99, 909. Do you see oh, yeah, that you're right. in? You've got the wrong, wrong number. Yes. Nine, nine, I'm sorry. Yeah, it is a 9-9. Nine, nine. I, I stand corrected. Yes, 9-9. Nine, nine. That'll become 12.5, and we'll, we'll deal with that along with the other two items, as you suggested, Bruce. Any other items that members of the board would like pulled or brief comments? Not seeing any. Are there members of the public that would like to make a comment on any of the items on the consent agenda? Take a pause here. It takes us a while to find people sometimes. There's quite a few on the call. I don't see any hands. I don't see any. I would be prepared to move the consent agenda. I'll second it. I'll second as, it. A, as amended or as, yeah. As amended. Yeah. yeah. So I'll take that. It is a motion from John Leopold. Thank you, John. And that was yeah, seconded by Ed, I believe. Um, Ed. I'm sorry, so the motion was by Leopold and the second was by? Ed Bottorf. Bottorf, thank you. Any other comments? We have to do a roll call vote under the state regulations, so we'll have a roll call on the consent agenda as okay. a minute. Director Bottorf. Aye. Dr. Kaufman Gomez. Yes. Dr. Gonzalez. Yes. Dr. Leopold. Yes. Dr. Lind? Yes. Dr. Matthews? Aye. Dr. McPherson? Aye. Dr. Myers? Aye. Dr. Pegler? Aye. Dr. Rothwell? Still not here. Dr. Rotkin? Aye. Motion passed with amendments. Thank you. We are now on to item number 10. This is the presentation of employee longevity awards. Okay. We have some impressive ones this morning. Um, we have an award, uh, we're recognizing in terms of uh, long service to this district, Francisco Estrada, Maricela Mendoza, John, and John Thomas. And at 35 years of service to this district, Andrew Hill. 
uh, one has to be impressed. <laughs> 35 years of service, that's, that's nothing uh, to be uh, ignored for sure. That's very, very impressive. Um, and uh, we appreciate when people stay with us, having that kind of experience in our, in our district really makes a difference to the uh, service we can provide to the public. I don't know if Alex has any additional comments he'd like to make or anyone else from the staff. I'm not hearing you. You're unmuted, but you're not. There's no sound. Alex, you, you go ahead. You seem to be muted, even though it doesn't show muted on the screen. We're going to wait just a second. I think Donna wanted to make a comment. I would too. If Yeah, 35 years, 20 years. Um, amazing. We just really appreciate those who have stayed with, the, for, with us for so long. Um, their experience and leadership really mean a lot to this district, and we're going to miss these people as they leave. But uh, thank you very much. But they're I not leaving. These, these folks are getting longevity awards. They're going to go on working. Yeah, I got it. I <laughs> Thanks, though, for your comments. And then Donna had a comment. Yeah, I just um, also wanted to echo um, just congratulations and uh, just um, very much appreciate all your service and look forward to seeing you uh, on, at number 40, maybe, John. <laughs> Thanks. Actually, I think it's Andrew Hill who's been oh, here. Oh, I'm sorry, it's Andrew. Yes, sorry, Andrew. Although 20 years is nothing to sneeze at either. Yeah, exactly. So when you get to the retiree, which is the next agenda item, you'll notice that um, Mr. Hill is actually retiring after his. He is practice. retiring. I, I was going to say, I thought his name. Okay, so. Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. okay. okay he is. Right. Congratulate him on 35 and yes, happy right. retirement. Okay, there's no other action required on number 10. On number 11, uh, we have uh, retirees to, to appreciate, and that is Andrew at 35 years of service, Michael Mullis, Arlen Roy, Esteban Ruiz, and Donna Smith. That does require a resolution. I think we could pass them all in one action. It will take a roll call vote to approve those that resolution. I move approval of all resolutions. Who made the motion? Sorry. John Leopold. John Leopold. I second that. And Larry Pegler made a second. Any additional comments? Then we'll have a roll call vote, please. She's on mute. There we go. Still can't hear her. We, we can't hear you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all for your patience. You know, it's not often people tell me they can't hear me, so this is kind of a compliment. <laughs> <laughs> okay, retiree resolutions for agenda item 11. Director Baltor. Aye. Director Kaufman Gomez. Yes. Director Gonzalez. Aye. Director Leopold. Aye. Director Lind. Aye. Director Matthews. Aye. Director McPherson. Aye. Director Myers. Aye. Director Pegler. Aye. Do Director Rothwell, not here. And Director Rotkin. Aye. Approved, thank you. Here's Mike, you. Just double checking, can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah. Oh, we got it fixed, okay, thank you. And uh, appreciate that and appreciate again, the, the service for these folks who are retiring after uh, having served this district for so many years. Our next item, <clears throat> item number 12, is the introduction of Danielle Glagola, our new marketing and communications and customer service director. And I'll leave that to Alex to make the uh, introduction. Sure, Mr. Chair, directors, uh, just in way of a brief introduction, and then I'm gonna ask Danielle if she would make a few comments. Um, after an exhaustive search for a marketing and communications and customer service director, uh, we hired an excellent candidate in the way of Danielle. Um, she has really hit the ground running and uh, producing some great product for us. Uh, especially in the way of collateral related to uh, the COVID and COVID prevention. 
Um, probably no more important time to have this position filled than right now when we're both trying to communicate all sorts of uh, safety and prevention messages to our customers and uh, also try to figure out the right strategy for attracting customers back to our system in the coming days and weeks. Um, so Danielle is a local UCSC graduate with over 14 years of marketing, public relations, communications, and event experience, having managed several marketing departments including marketing operations, creative services, copywriting, video development, a brand, public relations, and web, as well as corporate and customer events. She also spearheaded development and management of the first marketing operations department in a leading high-tech uh, entertainment company. She also participated in Santa Cruz's uh, Citizens Police Academy in 2018. So I'd like to join with you in welcoming Danielle, and, and uh, if you would allow Mr. Chair for Danielle to make a few remarks. Of course, welcome Danielle. Hi, thank you for having me. I just wanted to say, you know, I'm happy to be here and contribute. Um, and it's, it's a pleasure just meeting everybody on this call and working with the Metro team. What was your major at uh, UCSC? My major was actually uh, anthropology. Well, interesting. Yeah. I know, there is a switch there. <laughs> well, welcome on board. We're happy to have you. Marketing is going to be an important, really important function for us as we begin to try and expand our services. Someday we will be past some of these crises, one hopes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, <laughs> that would be well, nice to start focusing on some other things eventually, but the cause now is really important. So we've been really, you know, pushing forward with our COVID-19 measures and, um, you know, promoting that. So happy to help. Thank you. And again, welcome on board. Thank you. Um, our next items, I'm going to treat them all, uh, all three together, is 12.5, uh, which was 909 on the consent agenda, number 13 and number 14. I'll leave it to Alex to figure out in what order he wants to treat all three of these items, but they're all interrelated. So take it away, Alex. Sure, Mr. Chair. And, and uh, as questions come up about ridership, I'll uh, ask uh, John Ergo, our planning director, to Which step in. Offer, but I'm going to... Um, okay, so uh, directors, uh, you might recall that in April I gave you a fairly exhaustive overview of what we had done relative to COVID as an agency to protect our employees, to protect our customers, and to further the, the message about prevention. Um, that actually took us all the way back to somewhere in around the January timeframe. Uh, then in your June meeting, I gave you a brief overview but uh, today I'm gonna to give you uh, an overview that goes back to kind of April, June and carries forward from that point. It's rather lengthy, but it's, it's uh, really good and useful information for you to be aware of. And I know most, if not all of you are aware of a number of these items, but also for our public to, to see what we've been up to. So with that introduction, if we could put the slide up. Let me say, Alex, I, I think we appreciate the details here because we, if others are sharing my experience, we kind of feel not as in touch as we usually are. I usually visit the district and talk to people and members of the staff and so forth, and that's not happening. So getting a complete picture of what's going on would be really useful for the board, I think. Absolutely. And, and uh, Mr. Chair, we really want, as you'll see in this message today, to attract our customers back to our service and instill their confidence in us. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> So again, additional COVID prevention measures taking us back to uh, April and June in some cases. Um, we installed hand washing stations and deployed those at the Watsonville Transit Center, the Scotts Valley Transit Center, and Pacific Station, or sometimes called Metro Center. We've installed hand sanitizing dispenser on all of our buses with the exception of one that's in the shop. Uh, when that comes out of the shop, we have the hand sanitizer to install. Um, we're moving next to 32 paratransit vehicles, um, but these uh, wonderful hand sanitizing dispensers that we've purchased are on back order. So as you can imagine, they're in high demand these days. So we'll get those installed on Paracruz as quick as possible. As I'll show you a little bit later on in the picture section, we're installing the clear plastic sneeze barriers. And, we're, and those are sort of between rows uh, of seats on the buses themselves <coughs> for customers. So if you had a customer sitting behind you and they sneezed or they were talking or for some reason they didn't have a face covering on, this is meant to be your protection from the so-called airborne droplets. So we're now at, uh, we made good progress there. We're now at a little over 50% of the fleet. Uh, and, and Joseph over in the uh, uh, mechanics area is just doing a fabulous job 
Um, this is a difficult task because over the years we've purchased so many different buses from different manufacturers and within manufacturers different series. There is not one template that he can make that works for all. So oftentimes he has to make a separate template for each of the buses. Um, but if you've seen his work product, and I'll show you some of that later on, he's done a fantastic job. So kudos to him. <clears throat> Let's ask one question. Uh, uh, sure. Uh, is the plan to maintain those after this god awful COVID crisis is over? I mean, there's no reason to take them down, is there? Or does it inhibit uh, movement on the bus or take away seats or uh, overall? Uh, do you think that will they'll stay in place afterward? Yes. Yeah, so two things in that respect. <clears throat> one, one, we're treating this as the new normal. Um, we don't see that when COVID goes away that we will pull these barriers down and, and trash them. Um, second, these are seen as a quick measure, as quick as possible to do, so that we can get an extra protection in place, uh, but a temporary measure. So we're also simultaneously, just like with the bus operator co compartment and the clear curtain that takes a beating, it's a temporary protection measure. So relative to that and these between row barriers, <clears throat> we're investigating the possibility of buying the permanent plexiglass version of those. So permanent plexiglass is available, has been available for years for the driver's compartment, but this whole between seat barrier is, is a new and evolving industry. Um, that one might be a little bit tougher to convert, but we're working on that. There are a couple of businesses out there that are actually doing that now. We're also simultaneously investigating uh, the possibility of FEMA funding most uh, or at least maybe even half of the cost of these two plexiglass conversions. So as quick as we can get all that in order, we'll move from the temporary environment into the permanent environment. COVID eventually goes away. We're ready for whatever the next thing is. But we do see this as, as uh, the new normal. Thanks, Alex. Okay, continuing on. <clears throat> um, as you'll see a little bit later on, uh, Danielle has done a, a fantastic job with collateral related to COVID-19 prevention flyers and uh, bus car cards that are on our buses. We'll show you some of that in a little bit. Uh, we increased our self-imposed bus capacity limits to 25 third, 25% um, of the total capacity, total capacity on a 40 foot bus being approximately 60 people with standees. <clears throat> However, you have a note there that says on highway 17, we've reverted that back to the eight passengers because Santa Clara County's health agency or health officer uh, has issued a much more restrictive order for transit than we have on this side of the hill. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a few minutes too. <clears throat> uh, as we, I indicated, the bus driver compartment clear plastic curtain was completed on June 15, and that is the date that we chose once we made the full conversion to go back to resuming the fare collection, which we did on June 15. Next slide, please. We hired what we call cleaners. These are temp employees. They're stationed at the transit centers. You'll see them at Capitola Mall, Watsonville, Scotts Valley, Pacific Station. And they, uh, they, are, they are staffed with a bucket of, of disinfectant and a rag. And their job is in, anytime a bus comes through the terminal to quickly jump onto that bus and, and uh, disinfect all high touch surfaces, stanchions, uh, grab handles, backs of seats, things like that. Um, so not only do our buses get disinfected um, using the, uh, the, the static uh, fogger at night, but throughout the day, as they roll through the transit terminals, they get an additional disinfecting of high touch surfaces. <clears throat> On April 25th, we started enforcing the county health agency order that all customers waiting at a bus stop, boarding a bus and riding a bus must wear face coverings at all times. So we've, we've uh, produced a sign at the front door of the bus. It says no mask, no ride. The only caveat there is if somebody represents that for, for, for health reasons, whatever that may be, we don't inquire, for health reasons, they cannot wear a face covering. And we know there is a small population of people that fall in this category. We, we demand that they wear a face shield instead. Those are readily available these days. And that's how we have chosen to solve that particular issue. <clears throat> in order to better service our customers, uh, because we closed the transit center lobbies down, um, we've installed customer service windows at Pacific Station. A Pacific Station uh, exterior facing window is fully operational now and, and Rena has that staffed 
uh, five days a week now. And at Watsonville Transit Center, we're in the process of wrapping that up. We hope to have that one completed by somewhere around mid-September. It's been a challenge to get bids, and then it's been a challenge to mobilize uh, people and, and to custom order the glass that's needed. So there's been challenges there, but we think we'll have Watsonville exterior facing window open by mid-September. <laughs> also for ease of credit card transactions or to reload your cruise cards, we moved our two ticket vending machines, one at Watsonville, one at Pacific Station, to the exterior of the building. They were no good to us on the interior because we closed the lobby. So our, our wonderful people in facilities did some really quick work getting all of the electrical and communications out to the exterior and we relocated those ticket vending machines to the exterior. And now our customers can access that for, fare, for purchase of fare or reloading their cards 24 seven. And then as I mentioned before, we deployed our new electrostatic disinfectant fogger. Um, we bought uh, two or three of these, they're very expensive. They took a long time to get in. Uh, and we were using a different kind of fogger prior to that, but this is a much better fogger. Um, I, I'm not an expert at the technology, but uh, uh, as I understand it, the way this works, because it's electrostatic, for example, if you spray the disinfectant onto a stanchion, um, because of that electronic effect that takes place, the disinfectant actually wraps itself around the stanchion. So you don't have to take the fogger and do a 360 degree around the stanchion. Um, the electrostatic part of it uh, works out well. So that's really cool technology. Next slide, please. So next came uh, a lot of uh, CDC information about in increasing inside outside airflow, air exchange. And uh, the CDC has recommended that, that uh, in buildings, you increase that to as high as you possibly can uh, again, uh, taking the airborne droplets and moving them to the outside and bringing in fresh air. <clears throat> so we, we hired a HVAC technician to come in and to review what we could do at all of our different facilities. We ratcheted up our inside outside air exchange to the maximum possible. Um, and in some places, place, some examples, we increased that 50% um, over the previous rate. Um, in conjunction with that, we increased our air filters to what's called a level of MERV that's MERV 13. So that provides uh, even more protection for the inside of our buildings. Uh, I will say that, that we entered into an interesting challenge like everybody else that's anywhere that has an office building anywhere near the fires. Um, we had to actually turn this back a little bit and temper it back because we don't wanna bring in all of the smoke. So that's part of what we've been working with with the HVAC tech to make sure we get that right. Um, also, to, de to date, our employees have taken advantage of the Families First Act. That's, that's a new law, as you recall. It, um, um, it, it's, it's expanded FMLA, and it deals with COVID and child care. And so they've uh, taken advantage of those, uh, those rights to do so to the tune of 6,741 hours. And if you just look at that as rough, rough what, what is the potential lost productivity or the uh, equivalent FTEs? that would equate to approximately 3.2 annual FTEs. Uh, so that's pretty significant. Uh, that's a, that's a, a, a lot of hours associated with Family First Act. Again, not complaining, they're entitled to that and they're, they're taking advantage of that. Um, we initiated work on two customer service kiosks, one at each location, uh, Watsonville and Pacific Station. And what that will do, we hope, we hope that that will be up and running by September 4th, that's what we're targeting. And what that will do is allow customer to not bother the, the agent at the window um, who might have a question instead and go to the kiosk and push a button and communicate with the customer service. There'll be a video camera there. The customer service rep will be able to see them and communicate and answer whatever questions they might have right there at the facility. Um, so again, trying to compensate for not having the lobbies open uh, and looking for creative ways to provide more service to our customers. Um, so look forward to that uh, somewhere around the first week of September. Alex, can I ask you, are, yeah. if it's uh, bad weather, are, is there, are they covered so a person could stand there and talk to the folks without being rained on, or what's the situation there? Yeah, they're, they're not up yet, but they'll have to take advantage of that. Just similarly with the uh, relocation of the ticket vending machine, we needed to place those where they wouldn't get uh, you know, directly hit by the rain. Thank you. So we'll have to do the same thing with the kiosk. 
And I know, I know Freddie and Isaac are working closely on that. <clears throat> we also, uh, at one of our uh, uh, weekly COVID meetings with SMART, um, and Nate, I believe it was, suggested that our paracruise vehicles should be able to take advantage of going through the transit centers and having the cleaners board their buses in between customers. We thought that was a great idea. I think we virtually put that into place virtually the next day. <clears throat> so now in between customers, uh, our paratransit drivers can go to one of those two, one of, or Capitola, one of the four facilities for that matter, and, and have their high touch surfaces disinfected. Sorry about that. Um, so that's been in effect and that was a great suggestion. In addition, we purchased a number of tables and chairs, I believe from Costco, um, that we use to help increase physical distancing at our transit centers. Um, for example, at Watsonville and at Pacific Station, we have located those in what was formerly the lobby so that our bus operators, uh, when they're on layover, don't all cram into the small room upstairs. We want to get them spread out. So now they can either be upstairs in that room or they can be out in the lobby and spread themselves out a little bit more. We also added uh, those table, one table and some chairs here at Vernon so our employees here could sit outside and get some fresh air. Again, working with the recommendations of the CDC um, to have people uh, be in the fresh air as much as possible. Next slide, please. So we continue to offer uh, some non-precedent setting temporary emergency pandemic telecommuting for qualifying employees. And uh, I'm happy to report under this item that uh, um, I've notified uh, some members of the union and some of our staff that we're going to extend that uh, through an additional 30 days through September. Um, and in addition to that, because we've had uh, all sorts of complications related to the fires and uh, some of our employees being evacuated, um, we're going to have an impacts meeting negotiation, I forget which one it is, uh, with the SEIU to talk about um, telecommuting, the fire impacts on those groups of employees and what we might be able to do uh, possibly a little different than what we're doing for the rest of the employees and rolling over into September. So we should have more to report on that, but uh, um, we came to a, an 11th hour agreement last night, I think somewhere around midnight or maybe early this morning, that that would be a good way to go to try to resolve that, that immediate concern. Um, that's, so effect, thank, that's effects bargaining, I assume. Uh, that could be, yeah, I, I'm not real familiar with the terminology, but yeah. Uh, basically, we want to understand what, the, what it is that uh, our employees are experiencing that are, um, have been evacuated from their homes and, and what we can do to try to help them out. Thank you. So um, thank you to the SEIU for working with me through the night last night and early morning today to come to that uh, conclusion. And uh, let's see, uh, we continue to have our weekly COVID meetings with both the SEIU and SMART and SEIU did something uh, creative. They put together one of those surveys, uh, Survey Monkey maybe, and uh, surveyed their members uh, in preparation for, for the partial telecommuting in which in July, we had employees starting to return to the workplace. We put in a host through the month of June, Freddie's team put in a host of all of the CDC guidance about returning to the workplace. Um, but we also wanted to hear from our employees, what did we need to do to help you feel more comfortable in the workplace? We got some suggestions there that we implemented. <clears throat> we have provided all of our bus operators the opportunity to have a face shield we think that's important when they're, when they're uh, securing a wheelchair patron, because that's the one time, the one time that our bus operators are really super close to the customer. And even though the customer has a face covering and the operator has a face covering, we just felt, uh, especially based on industry practice across the nation, that it was a good idea to have the face shield available too. So they can, do, they can put that on when they're securing a, a, a wheelchair customer. Uh, also, this week, we completed our first all-hands COVID town hall meeting with SMART members. That was on the 25th, and we did our first virtual all-hands COVID town hall meeting with SEIU members on the 26th, um, and we might do that again in the near future. That was uh, something that was suggested by both state and federal guidance in order to help uh, uh, educate your employees on COVID prevention and to entertain questions 
Um, we also had e EAP representation there. So that they could, what's that could, for? EAP? EAP. Uh, Don, help me out. EAP. We get stuck in the acronyms and abbreviations. Employee Assistance Program. Employee Assistance Program. Thank you all. <laughs> oh, such a simple answer. <laughs> okay, next slide, please. Excuse me, how do, you, how do you have an all hands meeting if we have drivers that have to be taking people somewhere? Yeah, it's it, the drivers have always been a challenge, even when we do in things. And so I, I thought I would be creative this time and put it at a, a little bit later time than I traditionally do, five o'clock, trying to catch a, a, a little bit larger bundle of our operators, uh, but that, that failed again. So we're still trying to find the, ma the magic um, time to have bus operators participate in all hands. We, we just get sort of lucky and have a small number. In this case, it was mostly paratransit folks. Chair, sure, so, I have a question. Sure. On, really on, that, on, that, on that meeting, is that uh, recorded and can the uh, operators or employees that don't have that opportunity to, to be there, view it and then send questions in? Yeah, it's a great question. And uh, either SEIU or SMART had, uh, we requested that in advance of the all hands meeting. Um, so we did in fact record both sessions. Um, we're gonna work with IT in the coming week to figure out where we can post that so that people can go look at that. And, and that's, I'm glad you brought that up Aurelio because that is one way for those bus operators who couldn't participate for various reasons to go on their own time and review that. Okay, uh, the next page is, is literally a page out of the APTA book. Um, tailor, tailored for our need, and it's, it's on our uh, website now, and uh, of course in your PowerPoint here, uh, and it talks about what our customers and Metro are doing and requiring. <clears throat> so on the Metro side, government guidance, we follow CDC, state, and local guidance whenever possible. We protect each other uh, by deep cleaning high-touch surfaces, disinfect our buses and paired cruise vehicles and facilities, uh, we make informed choices. We provide useful COVID prevention information and resources to support safe travel. Uh, health is first. <clears throat> Our employees use PPE, personal protective equipment. That one I got. Uh, adjust the airflow within their buses. So just like we talked about the need to adjust airflow within your buildings, your physical structures, um, they also have guided us to say, hey, find ways to increase airflow. So we've produced a flyer for bus operators to learn how to increase that airflow of exterior air coming through your bus and pushing out the old air. <clears throat> so we've, we've uh, educated our operators on that. We deploy uh, the protective clear curtain, of course, hand sanitizer dispensers, and we, uh, we, we regularly repeat ourselves saying, please don't come to work if you're sick. What do we expect of our customers? Well, we expect them to follow federal, state, local, and metro guidance. <clears throat> we, we ask them that they always wear their face covering and that they properly wear it and continue to wear it when they're on the bus um, and that they not remove it uh, and that they follow CDC guidance relative to washing your hands regularly and length of time. <clears throat> In the way of informed choices for our customers, we adjust our travel time. We ask them to adjust their travel time to the greatest extent possible to the off peak uh, and that helps us to bring the loads down and spread the loads out. And then of course, we ask them to not ride when they're sick uh, observe physical distancing from not only the operator or driver in a pair crew situation, but also others, and not to sit in block seats and uh, don't talk. That's new guidance coming from CDC. When you're on a bus, don't don't talk. Uh, Alex, one question again from Bruce. Yes. Um, we at the County Board of Supervisors, in particular, people really protest uh, requiring face masks and uh, so forth. Have you had that much? Um, uh, pushback from uh, riders uh, saying, hey, I don't want to do this and that, I mean, it, it really, I hope they respect the rider, uh, the uh, bus drivers and uh, what they, their job is and what they have to do and they want to get going. Uh, but have we had any problems in that, res in that regard? We have. We, we have uh, had some intermittent issues. Now, I've been very clear with our bus operators. They are the captain of their ship. Um, they, they are the enforcer of that. You must wear a face mask or face shield. Um, and, and pretty much across the board, people comply. Um, but when we look at our pass up data, we do have a set of data that shows where people did not have face, ca face coverings. And so we did let them ride. Uh, our operators are trained 
on conflict avoidance, uh, how to bring sort of the temperature down. Um, but sometimes they'll run into a tough customer um, and they just won't listen. And uh, if that person's already on the bus, I've instructed the bus operators, if they won't put their face covering back on and wear it properly, they should pull the bus over. Um, they're in full, full control. Again, they're the captain of their ship. Um, ask the person to put it back on properly. If they don't, then to radio dispatch and dispatch might send a supervisor or they might send the police. Uh, same thing if it's somebody giving them a hard time when at the boarding of, at the front door, they would follow that same protocol. Do um, we have face masks on? Do the, the, the drivers have face masks to offer if, if they uh, if they say I don't have a mask? Yeah, so we, we did, and I'm going to talk about that in a moment uh, because we got a lot of face coverings from the, the federal government. They, they were dispersed throughout our system. We're thinking about doing another round of, of those, um, but really at this point, so far in from the order countywide that people must wear a face covering wherever they are, um, we really kind of assume they've taken the personal responsibility to have one with them and, and that it's not the best kept secret either. Uh, but our bus operators do a fantastic job in, in dealing with that conflict when it does occur. And sometimes people get heated. I think in the last month I've had uh, two reports where somebody who was being refused service kicked the door and broke, broke the glass. And that's very unfortunate. Next slide, please. So I mentioned that we moved the ticket vending machines to the outside of the building and and um, uh, Mike or, or whoever asked the question about the weather, you can see both of these machines are, are under the awning or the overhead cover. And likewise, we would do that with the kiosk. Um, so that's pretty cool to have them on the outside. Next slide, please. And the customer service window, the one on the slide on the right <coughs> shows you both the ticket vending machine and the customer service window. And, and our creative folks in customer service have put up a nice big sign with an arrow saying, you know, customer service, come here. We're trying to get people to use that window and, and not expect to try to get inside the center. And then you can see the current state of construction of the exterior facing window at Watsonville. Um, so both of those are, are great additions. Next slide. <clears throat> in the way of protecting our customers, we talked about the between row sneeze barriers. These are installed on Highway 17 buses, by the way, and we've completed installing these on all of the Highway 17 buses. And I just look at that workmanship that uh, Joseph has, has done on those. He's just done a fantastic job. Uh, they, look, they look good and they look like they could last a long time. Next slide, please. Alex? Yes. Uh, how much does it cost to do that for each of those? Uh, so that's a good question. And Eddie, I think Eddie is on the line. I will tell you that we are doing it in-house. And um, it, it is, uh, we order the plastic and then our uh, upholsterer uh, does all the work in-house. So there's the labor part of it and, and probably a much lesser expense associated with the plastic. Eddie, are you on to answer that question? Apparently Eddie's not on. Dan, I'm going to send that answer back to the whole board, please. Okay. Uh, question, cost barriers. Okay, got it. And then uh, I mentioned that we put the hand washing. Oh, was there something? Yeah, Alex, that would presumably be eligible for FEMA or some reimbursement. Um, I believe uh, Christina and Wandamu are looking at that. I don't know if they have a definitive answer on that yet. Um, so we're, we're trying to, we're, we're carefully navigating the FEMA world. Um, they're really, they're, they're tricky. They have a lot, a lot of paperwork for, for a little bit of money. And um, we just don't want to make a mistake. So if anything is even close to being gray, we don't throw it into the pot for FEMA reimbursement. Um, okay, next slide. Uh, I'm sorry, stay with this slide. <clears throat> so in a way of protecting our customers, you can see that we rented these hand washing stations, which we put at uh, the three transit centers. That gives our uh, customers and even our bus operators the opportunity to wash their hands and disinfect their hands. And then there is an example of one of our cleaners uh, quickly hitting the stanchions on the buses uh, as the bus rolled into one of the transit centers. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Continuing on protecting our customers, you see one of our employees uh, electrostatic spraying the uh, uh, disinfectant, uh, disinfectant fogging. Uh, that's what we do at night. And then on the right slide, you'll see an example of a hand sanitizer 
dispenser that is located near the uh, fare box for the customers as they board the bus. Next slide, please. I talked to you a little bit about uh, Danielle's work on our collateral, uh, COVID pre prevention collateral. Um, <clears throat> when COVID first hit in, in April, um, we developed in-house flyers and ran them through the color copier and cellophane taped them to windows and surfaces everywhere we could to get the message out. <clears throat> now we've moved into a phase of trying to continue the messages that need to be there, but to make them look a little more professional. And so uh, upper left-hand corner, you'll see six foot social distancing. And that is the, the uh, car card that is in all the Highway 17 buses, because again, the Santa Clara County Health Officer has said, you'll have six foot social distancing on buses you Santa Cruz bring into our county. So those are there. For all of our buses on this side of the hill, we have the lower right-hand corner, which is the physical distancing, uh, encouraging people wherever possible to keep as much distance as they can. <clears throat> the clever little face covering mandatory, how to wear it, how not to wear it. And upper right-hand corner, uh, there is a theme here where we're trying to encourage customers to use the various tools we have available, online, customer service, schedule by stop, text and email, to get the answer to their question or satisfy whatever their transit need is in a touchless, contactless environment. And uh, that's one way to do it. So we've tried to educate them there. Next slide, please. <coughs> Again, an example of our new No Mass, No Ride. And by the way, uh, uh, these, these car cards are all in English and Spanish. And then, of course, the lower right-hand corner is the ongoing CDC guidance about uh, washing your hands and uh, how long to do that. Next slide, please. And Bruce, to your question, there they are. They're, this is uh, one of the ways that we distributed uh, face coverings to our customers. And I just want to give a hearty thank you to the FTA. They provided us free of charge um, and not just us transit agencies across the nation, but our proportionate share was 5,000 face coverings. And we, di we, we distributed those across our system fairly rapidly. Um, and so they were, they were here. And in some cases, unfortunately, because of the way we distributed them, people would take more than one. But we felt this was a better way to go than to have the operator handing it to them and, and having people come too close to the operator. <clears throat> in addition to that, the FTA provided us, Metro, our proportionate share of face coverings for our employees they gave us 5,500 of those. So thank you to the FTA. Next slide, please. Alex, if I could make a quick point uh -huh. on the last slide. I, I, I think Metro has now become a kind of common English word that people know what we're talking about, but maybe FTA doesn't mean anything to folks and we might want to spell out the agency on, on our warnings because I don't think anybody knows who the FTA is except our board members. There you go, Federal Transit Agency and-, and something, like that. You know, something that makes clear- Yeah, yeah. We, I didn't do a good job of, of- We should give them credit when they do the right thing. Absolutely, yeah. They, they are not only a funding agency, but a partner in transportation. They're also a regulatory agency, so they provide a lot of rules for us to follow and they audit us every three years. <clears throat> okay, moving on. In the way of COVID prevention measures protecting our bus operators, you'll see an example of a sign in the wheelchair uh, and ADA securement area. So quite a long time ago, I forget whether it was March or April, we took that wheelchair securement area and we, we secured, bolted those seats up so they can't be put down. Uh, it still can accommodate up to two wheelchairs. And then we posted this sign that it's a restricted area. So one of the most important pieces of guidance that came out of the CDC uh, and also the state is create physical distancing at least six feet between the customer and your bus operator. Very explicit in that case. <clears throat> so we put this in place uh, to protect the bus operator. And so if you have a wheelchair or two, the bus operator is approximately 8.5 feet from that customer. And if there are no wheelchairs in that securement area, then the first customer sitting in the first seat that's available to them is approximately 12 feet from our bus operator. Um, we won't allow any standees or any ambulatory people in the securement area until further notice. Next slide, please. <clears throat> I talked at length about the clear plastic curtain. There's an example on the left of what that looks like. Um, looks like a shower curtain. I think that's basically what it is. Uh, but that, that protects our bus operators from airborne droplets. And we have uh, educated them that they should deploy this at every stop. So they pull up to the stop, they deploy it, they open the door, people board, 
after everybody's paid their fare and they sit down, they, they pull the curtain back um, so that they can drive safely and they drive. And then at the, at the uh, dispatch desk, when they check in every day, they have all of the tools that they need. They can refill their one ounce bottle of disinfectant that we gave them. Um, they can, if they're having, if they wear glasses and they're having problem with fogging of the glasses, those of us who wear glasses and face coverings know that problem. <clears throat> There's a fogging agent, which really comes from the ski world, right? Ski masks uh, use that anti-fogging agent. Um, so we have that available. We have nitrile gloves available. And then of course we have the face coverings available all right there when they check in daily. And we keep that stocked up. Next slide, please. <clears throat> So in addition to protecting our bus operators, we're also uh, making sure that we protect our employees. <laughs> so here's a good example, starting on the left. Well, of course, in the upper two right and left-hand corners there, um, we have disinfecting wipes and disinfectant scattered throughout all the facilities. Not, here, not just here at Vernon, but Golf and, and JKS and over at customer service at the Metro Center. <clears throat> but in addition to that, um, we've taken our cubicles where, where our employees wanted to have this extra protection and not all wanted it, but where they wanted to have it, we installed the same kind of shower curtain uh, idea um, for anybody who wanted it. <clears throat> so you can see how creative our facilities for folks were. And, and they've just been astonishing. Let me just give a shout out to our facilities folks. Um, what they've done since March, um, you know, dropping one thing and moving on to the latest, whatever the latest urgent thing is, fabricating things in house and saving us money and getting it done as quick as possible. This is just an example. They've done a fantastic job of, the, of installing curtains on cubicles. <clears throat> and then uh, you'll see in the center that we purchased 23 of these uh, rather expensive of, uh, HEPA air, three-stage HEPA air filters or purifiers. And we've scattered those throughout our various facilities, both here at, at Vernon, over at Golf, um, at JKS, Judy K. Souza Operations, and the Metro Center. And I've just worked with Freddie to back order a few, I think up to 10 more of those um, because we're discovering, you know, as long as these fires hang out and this smoke finds its way uh, in a bad way to, to nearby our facility, um, some of that smoke does get into our facility. And so we're going to add some additional uh, three-stage purifiers here at Vernon and over at Golf, uh, primarily because of the fires and the smoke to, to scrub the air even more so. You'll see uh, in the right hand, top right hand corner, uh, you, I, I wish I had a before and after, but all of these cubicles over at Golf upstairs used to be low profile cubicles. And I'm a real big fan of low profile cubicles, but in the COVID environment, when we're asking employees to come to work uh, at the work site, um, we need to do everything we can to, again, control airborne droplets and consistent with employees coming back to the workplace guidance taller cubicles is suggested. <clears throat> Lower left-hand corner, you'll see uh, Gina's temporary plexiglass. Um, that's temporary. We, we are fabricating a much larger design that goes from wall to wall, and uh, that will stay. That'll never go away. It'll be permanent. Um, and then over at, uh, at uh, Paracruz, you'll see that we've put some plexiglass barriers in there with those other two slides. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Customer service became a bit of a challenge. So our, our facilities folks worked with Rena to come up with uh, the kind of protection that we needed in the customer service area. And then Rena works to try to spread the people out so that they're, they're not in, in two, uh, two side-by-side -side cubicles. And so what they did here, you'll see they put the plexiglass protection above the, the new cubicles, by the way, um, so that if somebody's on the other side, they're both protected from their airborne um, droplets. So again, great job to our facilities folks for that. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so then we get into the fall service. Um, if you build it, they will come back, we hope. I mean, that's our goal, right? So, our, so instead of saying, well, we only have X number of customers today, we should hack and slash our service way back, um, reduce all of our operating expenses, and just make the service available for the number of people we have today. That's not the philosophy we're operating under. <clears throat> we are hopeful that as the county continues to open up and that as hopefully we get increasing relief on physical distancing and bring our capacities of our bus back up over time, um, we're, we're hoping that people will come back to our system. But every day that we're not available, that we don't have a seat available to them, 
is a day that we're at risk that they'll find another way to get to work, to get to the doctor's appointment, to get to the grocery store. And once they do that, they are probably gone for good. So we need ridership in order to sustain uh, our current expenses, our current employment level. We need to put that service back to the greatest extent possible and, and slowly move towards increasing the capacity on buses. This is not just a Santa Cruz um, unique topic. This is a big topic across the entire nation talked about in the weekly nationwide transit calls every single week. Everybody is struggling with these same issues. Um, and and it, the agreement is pretty uniform that we got to get our people back on the bus when they're ready to come back on the bus. Alec, you already said this, but um, just to make it explicit, I'm assuming we have not done layoffs, even though we've cut back our service and um, so forth, and that our plan here is to maintain, <clears throat> maintain uh, folks without doing layoffs to be prepared to re reopen up service to the public, public in general. Am I correct in that assumption? Mike, you, you're absolutely correct. And I've, I've worked to a great extreme to avoid having to bring you that kind of a proposal. Um, so on the financial side, we looked at the CARES money and we looked at how we can best program that in order to make it last as long as possible. <clears throat> on the service side, we're working hard to put as much service as we can back as quick as possible. Um, and the two, the two combined will help us not have to broach the question of layoffs or furloughs. If we fail in attracting our customers back to the system, we'll have to have a talk about that because at some point we'll, we can't keep running empty buses. If they're just not coming back, we'll have to run less service. If we run out of money and there's no CARES Act II, or we don't figure out a way to sustain the system and the level of service when the CARES Act runs out, we'll be broaching that issue again. I, I take that to heart. I know I have the lives and livelihood of our 300 employees in my hands. And I think about that every day. I do not want to have to come to you and say, we have to lay off people. So we need the writers back. We need, we need to offer them seats when they want those seats. Um, and remember, 50% of those writers are hanging in limbo for when UCSC and Cabrillo College come back. Um, so we, we hope to have all of those. Uh, maybe the end of this year, if they carry their uh, virtual classes, into um, winter of next year, then that could be delayed even further. Um, Alex, uh, I just wanted to, maybe this is, you're gonna answer this later on under 9.9, but early August, I think our ridership was down 75%. Um, is that about, is it wholly is it getting better or maybe you wanna get that to that later, but. Uh, if you're reading my mind, we're, we're just about uh, 10 slides away from that one. Got it, okay. Can I hold it for that? Okay. That'll be fine. <clears throat> okay. Uh, so again, um, so as a part of that strategy, we're returning to pre-COVID levels of service countywide with a few exceptions. <clears throat> the biggest being, of course, school term. We already talked about that. Uh, and that's not just, when you say school term, it's not just UCSC, San Jose, and Cabrillo. Remember, this is also our, 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 our regular public schools too. Uh, and then, of course, Highway 17 service is, is at an abbreviated level also. Fall service changes will support enhanced essential travel, provide adequate physical distancing on board, and sustain a gradual reopening of the economic activity. <clears throat> when we surveyed customers in this past spring about the types of improvements needed to support ridership during the COVID pandemic, the highest ranked response was to increase, increase service. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Back to Highway 17, it'll operate uh, starting in the fall at a modified weekday weekend schedule. This will be greater than what we were doing in the summer, uh, which is currently for a few more days, and uh, not as much as we would do in a normal fall. So it's kind of a, a hybrid. <clears throat> as a result of all of that, both the school term service um, uh, and, and uh, UC, well, UCSC uh, in particular, and less Highway 17, we'll have a little bit larger extra board. And so we'll use that extra board judiciously and try to back up service wherever possible and, and uh, try to avoid or reduce pass ups. <clears throat> so we'll also have a new service initiative. We're targeting a soft launch on September 3rd, um, which would be the ability to purchase passes via a mobile phone. 
Um, and after my presentation, uh, John can answer any questions you have about that. Um, and then we had, a, we had an exciting call. Instead of getting almost daily calls about people who want to send us less money or no money at all, um, Cabrillo College called and said, hey, our students, even though they're doing virtual learning, our students are saying, we want to still ride the bus. And so Cabrillo College said they found some money and they reinstated the uh, student pass at Cabrillo College um, this past uh, 20, August 24th. So that was an exciting call to answer. That's wonderful. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Next slide, please. There it is, thank you. So all of that that I just talked about for fall is sort of our phase one welcoming back of our customers. Now we have to be careful. We can't overly mark market because one, we still are restricting the number of seats on a bus. Um, so, and, and two, we don't, we don't just have a lot of money, um, a lot of extra buses and a lot of extra bus operators to throw a whole bunch of extra service out there to respond to uh, um, too many people coming back all at one time. So it's, it's an interesting juggle, right? Because if they wanna come back, I want them to come back and I wanna get them on our bus so I don't lose them permanently, but I'm still faced with this tough constraint of physical distancing, uh, capacity limitations, and overall constraints on the number of buses we have available and people we have available to drive it. But for those that we want to come back and want to encourage to come back, we're starting a campaign. This is again, collateral put together by Danielle. She did a great job, I hope you agree. Um, these will start showing up um, probably in a couple of weeks or so after they get done at the printer on the sides and the tails of our buses. So as those buses are going down the street, we'll be marketing to our customers that we are disinfecting, sanitizing, and safety is important to us. So we hope that will help bring them back to us. Um, next slide, please. In the way of a financial overview, um, our projected operating expenses before transfers through June 30, this is just projection, and which is the end of your FY20, is that we'll come in at about 304,000 under budget on the favorable side, um, and that's before transfers. And then on the operating revenue side, therein lies the, the bad news. Through May 31st, that's about four and a half million dollars un, under budget, unfavorable, not good news. And of course, it's all the things that you know about and fully expect, our economy dependent revenue sources, passenger fares down, sale, local sales tax down, uh, TDA and STA. Now, local sales check tax might change on us. It's, it's, um, it's interesting that in the last two months of sales tax numbers that we got, we were at or a little above what we had budgeted. Now, that's kind of an interesting dynamic um, because it, what it does show is that, you know, right away after the COVID crisis hit in April and May, um, those sales tax those purchases people make, which trigger the sales tax, didn't plummet. Um, maybe if one wants to speculate, maybe that is in part because that is during the period of time in which we still have the $600 a week federal unemployment augmentation. <clears throat> so now we know, we all know that went away, I believe at the end of July. So in another couple of months, when we get the July numbers, um, we may see the effects of COVID on the economy start to hit more directly. Next slide, please. <clears throat> um, you asked earlier about FEMA qualified expenses. So in the period of March through June, um, we're at about uh, $229,000 uh, um, that we've accounted for there. And probably sometime in September, we'll actually make our claim. Um, and this is after a call with FEMA yesterday and going through our uh, identified FEMA qualified expenses, this number actually dropped from the previous number. Um, but we are still exploring the possibility of FEMA funding our uh, plexiglass barriers that we talked about earlier. Next slide, please. So now, now let's go from the FEMA cost, which is a unique part of COVID, to the total COVID-related costs. For the period of March through April for personnel costs and March through July for the non-personnel costs, you see those. So you see personnel costs at about a million three, non-personnel at about 410,000 for a total of the period through July slash August of about 1.7 million just related to COVID. 
and, and focus up in that personnel costs section on the district paid COVID-19, a million one, a million one. And what this category is, you might recall um, through, through, uh, um, through the uh, summer uh, bid, I had placed the bus operators in an A and B group. A group works this week, B group is paid, but they stay home. Next week they flip and so on and so forth. Daniel placed the paratransit on an ABC format, same kind of format. Those are COVID related expenses because we're paying somebody, but they're not actually working. We also did some other hybrids of that concept in the early days of COVID across the other functions within the agency. And all in all, in that period, March through August, that amounted to a million one uh, associated with all of that. So there's no productivity with all of that. That's not telecommuting. Tele when they're telecommuting, they're still, they're still logging hours just as they would if COVID is not here. These are COVID related payments for not working. Um, but that was our strategy, right? That was our strategy to bring down the number of hours of exposure, particularly focusing on our bus operators and our paratransit drivers, right? It, this applies to the others across the agency to a little bit lesser degree, but these are the folks constantly in contact with the customers. And so the strategy was we can, we can help protect them more if we can bring down the, the uh, number of hours they're potentially exposed some, to somebody who might be sick. And this was the strategy that we engaged in order to do that. It also, going back to one of the earlier questions, it was also a strategy that helped us not have to cross the bridge of layoffs and furloughs. We'll talk about that another day. Maybe we won't talk about it at all, but for now, this helped us to stave off a discussion about uh, furloughs and layoffs. Next slide, please. <clears throat> also within the financial discussion, we, we as you know, we have tenants uh, that we collect rent from at our various, uh, at our two facilities, Watsonville and Pacific Station. Um, so in March, when, when the shelter-in-place order came down from the county and the state, we, we had everybody close. We said, you got to close. Um, and we, we held their rental, their payments of rent in abeyance. Um, we, we wanted to do everything we could to try to help our tenants survive this crisis. And I know some landlords in the private sector are doing this and doing various versions of this, but this is what we did. <laughs> so at Watsonville Transit Center, Jessica's Grocery, they'll, they'll start charging rent uh, October 1st. He has reopened, um, but we, we gave him a chance to ramp up. And, and because we aren't running that much service through that center, uh, we felt we needed to give him a little bit of time to try to get uh, business to recover. And also, uh, on September 3rd, um, we will be at a higher level of service with the fall bid. So we have a big... If I could check, we, we didn't just defer their payments on rent. We just basically said, you don't have to pay us rent for these months. Is that correct? That's, that is correct. Okay. That is correct. <clears throat> and then the La Mancha space, uh, unfortunately, our uh, tenant owner of that uh, going concern passed away. Uh, Angela has been working with a new tenant and I believe uh, they're, they're signing, they've signed or they're signing a deal to become effective here in a couple of days, September 1st. <clears throat> Over at Pacific Station, El Harachi, um, that business started paying rent August 1st, so they, they got reopened. Uh, Java Cruz, our tenant there, who is also the owner of the Metro Market, consolidated his two businesses into one and vacated um, that space. And I'll talk about that in just a quick second. Next slide, please. Our tenant, Local Jerk, they reopened around the end of June. We reduced their rent to $500 instead of $722. They're starting to pay full rent August 1st with um, a half a half a month credit from March. As, as you know, we shut everything down mid-March, so we gave them a half month credit. <clears throat> then the Greyhound, um, they haven't been able to access the lobby um, to sell tickets, to store luggage and whatnot. But really at the end of the day, that didn't matter because they weren't running service to Santa Cruz. Um, at some point they discontinued service to Santa, Santa Cruz. We don't think it's permanent. <clears throat> they are apparently talking about when they're gonna reestablish that. Um, so Angela has talked to them about possibly moving their operation into the, the Java, uh, Java Cruise space. <clears throat> we think that'll work out really nice and we hope that they'll take advantage of that. 
Uh, Metro Market has been a very difficult one to get open. Angela's worked with them on a number of different concepts. Um, because of the way that market's configured in the transit center and, and its accessibility to the public, uh, it has been very difficult to open. <clears throat> They've come up with a temporary fix to try to get them open in the near future, but he's eyeballing the uh, Betty Noodle space right now. Um, he'd, he'd like to move over and assume that space. And uh, on that note, that particular tenant basically moved out uh, to open another restaurant way back in August 2019, <laughs> has uh, violated our contractual agreement where you have to keep a going concern and you can't be closed for any particular period of time. Um, in addition to that, that particular tenant is in default of paying rent uh, as of August. So um, we're working with them, our attorneys, their attorneys to try to sort this out. Uh, but if that space does become available, then, then Metro Market will move into that space, we think. Next slide, please. Bruce, here's your, here's your slide. Um, so this is, this is a ridership depiction. It's a very busy slide. So let me just tell you a little bit about what's going on. <clears throat> so COVID, on the far left, COVID hits mid-March. And, and you can see the slope of that line. Um, where ridership was the preceding month uh, was off of this particular scale. And if you look down um, in the 315 to 321, you'll see that ridership in the previous year for that same period was 102,400 riders. Uh, in this period, it was 25,140. So that's pretty dramatic. You can see that slope just plummet. <clears throat> and then you can see that we've plotted a number of things that are important to helping us understand why ridership is doing what it's doing. <coughs> Um, you know, we self-imposed um, uh, the, the six-foot constraint way back in April on ourselves, and uh, um, that was right about at the rock bottom <clears throat> of the ridership. Uh, and then as the county started to open up, you can see those little blocks there of when the county opened up. Uh, for example, you could do uh, takeout food, curbside takeout food, and then <clears throat> the, church, the churches could resume. And then... Um, then the gyms and bars and movie theaters could resume, and then the nail salons could resume. And look what's going on there. Ridership is slowly coming up, but look what's happening to pass ups. So we don't have, so in that environment in which we self restricted ourselves <clears throat> to eight people on a 40 foot bus, we don't have enough seats, we're passing up people, and we got way up there at about 376 in one week. Um, and then a couple of things happened that helped to resolve that, at least in the short run, and help us to start to continue to react to the ridership coming back. <clears throat> One is we changed our self-imposed capacity limits from 8 to 15 on a 40-foot bus and to 10 on a 35-foot on a bus on, on July 3rd. Um, but we also had a summer bid on 625 that took place, right? So with the summer bid, we were able to try to use the data that we had about pass-ups and try to program some, uh, some backup buses. Um, in some cases, they were shadow buses about 10 minutes behind. In other cases, they were sent out to sit in their bus kind of Uber-like um, at, at key locations and be ready for dispatch to call them. So pass-ups pass uh, dropped substantially. Um, now, keep in mind, a pass-up is a pass-up. If our bus goes to that stop and we're at capacity and they have to tell that customer, I can't let you on, but a backup bus is 10 minutes behind, um, we still classify that as a pass up. That customer still got service, but we didn't do our job successfully. We were not there ready to pick them up on the time, the designated time we were supposed to. A pass up is a pass up. And in some cases, um, we can only speculate that that person continued to remain at the stop for the next bus to arrive because it could be 10 minutes behind or it could be longer if the bus is sitting at one of the staging locations and has to go into service. So at the in, in that intervening time, our customer might wander away, go find another way to go wherever they're going or just give up on their trip. So we, we measure it from the, the first contact with that customer. If we can't get them on the bus, a pass up is a pass up. <clears throat> so you can see all of that continue to help us react to um, the, uh, in the county and essential travel increasing to open. Ridership continues to grow. Um, and then you see, you see a down two, two consecutive weeks of a downturn. 
Um, so one, as you know, we had an employee that tested positive that got a lot, a lot of press uh, out there. Um, and, and our union went on two very major uh, television stations, KSBW, KION, and, and made some pronouncements about um, capacity and how unsafe it is to ride. And, and I, I speculate that those two things combined um, caused that, that decrease in ridership for that week. And then the second downturn, um, the last week there on the slide, is obviously related to the uh, Santa Cruz County fires. We lost a lot of ridership when we had to pull back service. And now, when yep. you haven't made this explicit, you did earlier, but when you look at that yellow line that's of the pass buys, it's reasonable to speculate or at least ask the question, how many of those people are never coming back to the bus? They got, they didn't get picked up when they thought they would. It's not dependable for them and so forth. So that, that's a long-term problem for us. So I'm really happy to see that we've avoided now. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's why, you know, uh, I, I keep talking about, I need, I need to capture them when I can capture them. Um, and, and hopefully they will be recurring customers and not go away permanently. Um, you know, we got these conflicting messages, unfortunately. I'm, I'm working very hard to convince the public that we're safe and you should come back to us. And we unfortunately have this ongoing uh, debate with our union in which they're communicating a different message. Um, we need to be partners in this to, to secure customers back on our bus. If we can grab them and grab them when they're ready, then once again, as we talked about earlier, down the road as the CARES Act money runs out, or we have to evaluate the level of service based on the demand. If we work together on this and we keep getting those people on buses, instead of trying to drive them away, we stand a better chance of being able to keep that service out there in the long run. So uh, Alex, when you're at a uh, right place to break or at the end of this, we have a couple of people, James <coughs> Sandoval from Smart and uh, perhaps, perhaps another participant would like to make comments, but let's hold yep. those for just a moment. We'll take James first and then the other person, whoever that is. Yeah, if I can finish the presentation, Mike, then, uh, then I'll, uh, I'll be happy to turn it over if that's okay with you. Yes, that'll be fine. Okay, so continuing on. Um, so in, in this bus capacity controversy, you've heard different pronouncements about what adjacent counties are doing. So here's one way to look at the data. So as of August 25th, just a couple of days ago, um, I, I went into to, uh, two state sites to gather this data. And you can see the Santa Cruz, Santa Clara, and Monterey are adjacent counties um, because the, the be observation the has. Do you want to be on the next slide here? We're still. Oh, I'm sorry. Next slide. Next slide, please. I failed at giving a morning. There right. you go. So on this slide, as of August 25th, you can see the three counties because uh, it's been said that we're out of sync with our adjacent counties. And, and all I'm trying to do here, I'm not trying to be a doctor or a scientist or whatever. I'm just trying to utilize the data that's available. It's all sourced to the state site. So you can see that at the bottom if you want to go look at the data and, and figure out if I'm telling the truth. <clears throat> so as of the 25th, this was what data was in the state site. Santa Cruz County, 1708 cases. If you look at that against our population on a per capita basis measured at per, per 1,000 at 6.25, we were put on the watch list the state watch list on August 17th. <clears throat> we were only on that state watch list for three weeks. We are off that. Um, we've been off it for, uh, I think it'll, it'll have been 14 days this coming Monday. So good news for us. <clears throat> In contrast, Santa Clara County, the county that has the much more stringent transit order that we talked about, in which we had to bring our capacity down to eight to go into their county, they had 16,199 cases. They're at 8.4 per 1,000. They have been on the watch list since July 12th. They are still on the watch list today. <clears throat> Monterey County, our, our neighbor to the, to the south, 7,333 cases as of the 25th. They're at 16.89 per, per thousand. They've been on the watch list since July 2nd. They're still on the watch list today. <clears throat> I, I give you some information about the state re resiliency roadmap. Um, stage one, safety and preparedness. Stage two, lower risk workplaces. Stage three, higher risk workplaces. And stage four, end of the stay home order. And I'll come back to that in a moment. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so in addition to bus capacity in, in, in uh, being argued using COVID uh, cases across different counties, uh, there's been the argument that we're just <clears throat> out of sync with um, federal and state uh, rules and regulations and orders. 
Well, that's not true because if we were, then everybody on this list, um, virtually everybody on this list from the 15 to the greater than 15 category, which is the 41 on the left and the 18 on the top right, everybody here would be uh, operating illegally. It's just not true. <laughs> there is a bunch of guidance out there and we try to do, we try to conform to as much of the guidance as we, as we can, but guidance is guidance, it's not an order. The orders come down, the orders, the regulations, the law come down from the governor through the state and through the, through the CDC um, and then probably more so um, through our local health officer. So what you see on this is, is a collection of data. It's been growing, it's, it's very random. I surveyed the nation, it keeps growing. People call me every once in a while and say, hey, I wanna to respond to your survey. Or I'm on a transit call and somebody says, oh, we're at this capacity. I add it, I update this, this chart. It's, it's, it's a, a live document. What this chart shows you <clears throat> is that um, there is a category in the lower right-hand corner of 17 transit agencies that have less than what our standard is for 40-foot bus, less than 15. Now, a number of those agencies, um, which are in California, um, are, are investigating going to a higher capacity. And I'll talk about that in a few moments. The, there is a big category in the upper right-hand side in which 18 transit properties have been identified as being the same as we are, 15 people per 40-foot bus. And again, you'll note that there are a number of California properties listed there too. The overwhelming larger category Again, N is 76, 76 in this database. <clears throat> the overwhelming majority, 41 of the respondents are at greater than 15, anywhere from the 50% number all the way through a large chunk there at the top that have no capacity limits at all. Um, so that, that is the data, that, that's real data. I didn't skew it. I didn't say, oh, I gotta leave these people off because it, it's, it's data that doesn't support what I'm contending. It is all the data that came in and, and uh, in, and in some cases was updated as we sat in on these transit um, um, nationwide calls. So it's good data and we'll keep updating the data, but it shows that we are in sync with what's going on across the nation. It confirms we're not doing anything illegal. We're not breaking any orders, rules, regulations. And then finally on the topic of capacity, this just, uh, next slide please. This is hot off the press. This just came in. So I talked about the California properties uh, in Northern California, looking at increasing their capacity to our level or greater. <clears throat> but they, they took a little bit different tasks. They pulled together a task force because they're all in the MTC region, right? The, M the uh, Metropolitan Transit, uh, whatever region in Northern California, Santa Clara VTA over the hill, our neighbor is in that. We are not in that, in, in the MTC region. Um, so a number of properties, including the Contra Costas and the Golden Gate Bridge and all of those, they all work and receive their funding through the MTC, the, M the MPO, the Metropolitan Planning Organization. So they said, we should get some information that we can all use and share and consider applying to our agency. So they formed this Blue Ribbon Task Force, and they just completed that, that task force task and issued their final report and only one part of a greater discussion about uh, what new transit is going to look like and what we need to do to help keep our customers safe. One part of that was this physical distancing you see there. And I want to read the part in yellow because it's really important. <clears throat> the CDC currently advises six feet. However, it should be noted that the face coverings were not encouraged or mandated by the CDC when the six foot distancing metric was introduced. Where practical, Bay Area public transportation providers will provide for a minimum of three foot physical distancing coupled with uh, mandatory properly worn face coverings. Real important point there. If you recall back in March <clears throat> when the CDC said, oh, we, 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 our guidance, again, not an order, our guidance is six feet. Um, the CDC in the same breath was telling transit agencies across the nation um, don't have your employees wear face coverings. Matter of fact, it could do more damage than good. That's what they were saying. And they didn't, and that's at the same time that they issued their guidance of six foot. But later on, when they suddenly decided, whoops, that guidance is not so good about, about, um, about face covering on transit, 
Um, and, and this whole airborne droplets thing became what they focused on. At that time, they said, wow, everybody should wear face coverings, right? So, so they, changed the, they changed their perspective on it as a result of airborne droplets. But they, as this points out, they didn't go back and change their guidance. So their guidance is out of sync. Their guidance is in sync with no face covering, but out of sync with the face covering. That is such an important point. Where does the three foot come from? The three foot comes from the European standard and the World Health Organization. And that's where that comes from. So important points, um, again, trying to make the point, we are operating safely, we're not breaking any laws, and we're certainly not out of sync with other agencies. Uh, I think Dan has a question. Uh, yeah, Alex, I do. Um, you, so you provided the statistics in terms of um, other transit districts um, limiting the capacity or not limiting the capacity. Um, and we're pretty favorable in that regard. I'm just wondering though, if you have any information about whether those transit districts also have gone to the extraordinary extent that, that we have in terms of putting up plastic sheeting and protecting people from uh, each other, uh, in addition to just being six feet away. Um, are other transit districts doing all that or are they just limiting the capacity and requiring masks? Yeah, I wish I had thought of that question because it's such a great question. Uh, I will tell you that this agency has been on the cutting edge of, of this whole topic of protection. Um, we put in uh, the, the uh, clear, clear driver protection curtain um, well in advance of the overwhelming majority of properties across the nation. There are still agencies today on our nationwide call that are still talking about what they're gonna do. Do they wanna go permanent barrier? Do they, do they wanna go plastic? We said, we're gonna jump on this. We're gonna do it in-house and do it as fast as possible because every day we delay puts our operators at risk. We got it done fast. We were ahead of the game. We are way ahead of everybody in this discussion about between row uh, sneeze barriers. There are some agencies that are buying a product that is a permanent. There are some agencies that have installed something on there, maybe similar to ours in some cases, but we are in the small number of agencies who have just excelled in this area of protection of customers and protection of our bus operators. Um, so others are playing catch up. In some cases, many across the nation are not even contemplating on those nationwide calls um, going to these between row barriers like we have. Um, a large number of agencies are still not collecting fares, are still doing rear, board door, rear door boarding only. Um, that seems to be a common thread. Um, but pretty much uniformly across the nation, what I hear in these calls is that uh, everybody has, has, has signed on as fast as they could to the six foot social distancing between customers and the bus operator. And as I said before, that's the one piece of guidance that, that you read in both the state and the federal CDC that they're pretty emphatic about. You should distance your bus operator six feet from the customers. Um, but everything else, we're, we're ahead of the game. Even, even uh, um, and, uh, disinfectant dispensers, um, there are a lot of agencies that are doing it, but by no measure do I see a majority that have done what we're doing. Does that answer your question, Dan? Uh, yeah, it did. I was just wondering if you've shared this with other transit districts, uh, sent them pictures and like you've just shown us here today. Yeah, APTA has done a wonderful job of creating the ability for that to take place. So I, I upload pictures, uh, I share sometimes just through the chat when, the, when we're on a particular topic, and other times I'll ask for the floor and I'll share what we're doing. We, we get a lot of kudos for how fast we've done the things that we've done. You should go on, Alex. Next slide, please. I have a question. Yeah. Just, just, <clears throat> sorry, <clears throat> on the last <clears throat> page of your survey <clears throat> that you showed us of the, the no limits and then uh, less than 15 and greater than 15. Is there any information on when, uh, the amount of operator exposure uh, at the different uh, levels of the no limits, uh, greater than 15 limits and less than 15? Yeah, so we've been, we've been I think that question maybe goes to, um, are some of these other agencies that have greater limits experiencing more COVID cases? Um, there's, there's been a, a significant body of knowledge lately um, actually suggesting that transit is the safer place to be. Um, there is, there is, there, I think there was maybe one case in Detroit 
where, where there was some suspicion about it actually being potentially a COVID case caught on public transit. But other than that, um, I have not read, maybe others have read, but I haven't read anything about uh, contact tracing, bringing it back to the transit agencies. Now, all of these agencies uh, in varying degrees are reporting COVID cases within their employees, but, but not traceable to the, uh, necessarily to the, uh, the transit itself. Does that answer your question? Okay. Okay, on the, the uh, what's next? <clears throat> of course, the big talk today and these calls and everywhere is contactless, touchless, and even in the private sector, that's a big topic. Um, and as I've indicated, partly through this, this presentation, we're trying to work towards that. We have the Highway 17 smartphone flash pass app uh, that, that's coming system-wide. Um, we're trying to migrate our customers through our marketing programs off of cash and other fair media to the cruise card. We have some challenges to get the cruise card to work right before we start selling it because we're still trying to get GFI to get some problems fixed. And then we're looking at other technology in the planning department that can help us in that endeavor. Um, we've, we've offered uh, to our employees um, to have the employees, ident the, the two unions identify their members who are faced with, starting about April, August 10th, are faced with child care issues. <laughs> that is because the schools did not go to, back to in-person classes. Some number of employees across our agency are faced with child care uh, you know, issues related to those, their, their children learning at home. And so I've tasked uh, HR department to work with those employees to try to do their best to tailor make a schedule that will help them be able to accomplish both coming to work full time and taking care of, of their children, their school aged children. Um, and HR has done a great job in doing that. It is much greater challenge on the bus operator side to try to pull that off. Um, but they're still open to working with uh, the smart to try to explore different ways to solve that problem. And then you I'll see that you should have our, our uh, HR folks contact me starting uh, October 1st. I'm going to have a class and I'm in touch with other faculty at UCSC who have um, internship program courses where students could help the uh, tutors for the, uh, their kids at home, online tutoring help, things like that. So if someone wants to contact me who is working on that issue, they may be able to help some of those parents with their situation for their kids. Okay. Um, Don, I'm sure Don has just made a note as I am making a note. Uh, daycare. Okay. Good. Thank you, Mike. Thank you. So finally on this, this slide, you see the new headways that is, is uh, coming out here real soon. And of course the emphasis is on safety and on COVID. Uh, next slide. I'm almost done. <clears throat> so what's continuing with what's next? We're investigating automated temperature kiosks <clears throat> for, for, for our employees. We're investigating permanent plexiglass for the bus operators, permanent plexiglass for the sneeze barriers. Fall to late fall, planning is underway for an on-demand transit pilot. Um, we're currently testing our new Ecolane program for its booking capability through the app. That will be exciting. We're investigating uh, funding possibilities for automatic passenger counters on our buses. Um, the, here's, here's the exciting thing about automatic passenger counters or APCs. Remember, we're, we're in the process of installing automatic vehicle location AVL so that customers on their phone, their smartphone app, can see when the bus is coming and whether it's on time or not. We can add to that with the APCs, we can add to that that the customer can see how many people are on that bus probably never more important than right now in this pandemic environment. The customer will be able to see how many people are on that bus. And if that makes them uncomfortable, they can choose not to board that bus. They'll see it. So we're working on a proposal that we hope to bring to you in a, a month or two on uh, funding for APCs. <clears throat> we're also, Isaac in IT is also investigating the possibility of turning on the Wi-Fi on all of our fixed route, not just Highway 17. And that could possibly be done in, um, in late 2020, early 2021. Um, August 17th, the Santa Cruz was taken off the state watch list. 14 days later, which I believe is this coming Monday, maybe we're off, maybe the county, the state, uh, let people go back to restaurants and, and uh, hair salons inside instead of outside. I only bring that up because if that happens, 
we could see our ridership turn and go back the other way again and maybe even pass ups go up. And then finally, uh, Alex, Alex, can I interrupt you just one moment? Absolutely. Absolutely. Just, to, just, just to, for clarification, uh, the end of the 14 day period is actually today. Um, but the state is not allowing us to uh, allow people to go to dine in restaurants, salons, gyms, et cetera. We expect that um, new guidance will be coming out next week that will help us. But uh, being one of the last to go on the list and one of the, uh, one of the first, if not the first to come off the list, we're a little bit ahead of what the state was ready for, especially with the fires. So we think we're going to get guidance next week. But right now, everything will remain the same until we hear from the, from the state. Great. Thank you, John. I really appreciate that important clarification because, again, I, I'm linking a possible increase in ridership to whatever, whenever that happens, only because our data, as I showed you earlier, supports as more essential travel is, is allowed, more trips occur. Thank you. John, so I, yeah. well, one thing too, just for on John's point, I noticed this morning some TV ads on uh, KSBW, I think it was Michael's on Main and saying, we're now open again for dine-in seating. So there may be some confusion um, uh, for the restaurants. And maybe, I, maybe it's an old ad, but I don't think so. So just be aware that it sounds like there's some confusion from- Just so you know, I- I, I Michael's I on Main actually out, only allowing people outside on their deck. They're, it's outdoor eating and they're not actually inside Michael's okay. yeah. the, the ad, what their ad was possibly old. Yes, yeah, we, 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 I've asked our economic development office and our public information office to get the word out because it's, I've, re, I've received a lot of calls I've been reaching out to, uh, to businesses to let them know, but we need to do a better job. It's, it's what is obviously a very unusual um, thing where you're off the list, but you don't have any, uh, there's no benefit to being off the list. So we're all trying to figure this out. And, uh, and with the context of the fire, it just makes it a little bit harder. Yeah. Great, great clarifications. <clears throat> Final bullet on this slide. As permitted by state and local ordinance, Metro will likely remain at our self-imposed capacity limit of 25%, um, which I sort of attribute uh, to the California Resilience Roadmap Stage 2, with future increases in capacity likely occurring as the county progresses through the state's four stages of the resilience. For example, if permitted by state and local ordinance, uh, San, uh, Santa Cruz County stage three resilience, we could uh, look at possibly going to about a 50% capacity at that point. And then when Santa Cruz County uh, achieves a stage four resilience, possibly going to uh, the 75% or 100%. Um, all of those future steps also dependent on other circumstances uh, that might be occurring, including what is the state of recommendations of face coverings and physical distancing. Um, so with all of those caveats, that's kind of how I've, I've looked at the possibility of tacking our future capacity increases to the expansion of, uh, or, or through the successful moves through the resilience uh, stages. Final slide. Of course, all of our employees, bus operators, paracruz drivers, and all of the other employees that keep this organization running are heroes, they're frontline heroes. They're providing an essential service. They're helping people get to the places they need to go um, because without us, they couldn't get there. And Mr. Chair, that concludes our presentation. Thanks, Alex. I'm gonna hold up board questions or comments first here from the public. And so first, James Sandoval from uh, SMART, you're up. Make sure you're unmuted. James, are you there? I don't see James. It doesn't, it shows a hand, but it doesn't show a microphone. So you might be having the same problem I had. Yeah. Um, well, wait a moment. There, there's his microphone. That's a good sign. And then James, you just need to unmute now. There you go. It says he can't. There we go. Joe, you're on. Okay. I just got the option of muting myself. All right. So a uh, couple of things, uh, two points to your presentation. Um, first, I'll talk about MST. I actually called them myself and spoke to a manager. They don't allow 15 people on their buses. Uh, they allow a max of 10, and it's because they want to allow six feet between each passenger. And the next thing is, if you don't mind pulling up your ridership and pass bys um, chart that you had up. I don't have control of that. If the uh, CCTV can do it. 
Yeah, I'd li I really like to see that so I could point this out. We'll go back to it's slide the right. 27, please. Slide 27. Yep. Oh, 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 oh. oh, I'm sorry. I gave you I gave you my number, not your number. Go forward, please. One more. One more. Another one. Another. Another. There we go. There you go. That's the one. Oh, you passed it. 54. There you go. There we go. Okay, so uh, interesting point. Um, you mentioned how the factor of us not passing people up right now is because we increased the capacity on our buses. You said that was July 3rd. And as you could see, we had a significant drop before July 3rd. So I want to point out, and which we you know, brought up before and try to explain to everybody, we had only half of the operators working up until June 25th. So as you can see, around that time where we had a significant drop is June 25th, because all of our operators came back. And we had the ability to provide a lot more backup service that we weren't before. So that itself provided that significant drop in pass ups. And by the time we increased capacity limits, we already dropped pass ups. So I just wanted to point that out, you know, again, and just make sure we're all on the same page. Um, our biggest argument is that we, it, it, it's not so much that we're not providing safe transportation, we have the ability to provide safer transportation. And without getting further into it, that's all I have to say. Thank you for your comments, James. And there's another member of the public, I, I didn't see who that was. You want to identify yourself? They're... Not seeing anybody, Mike. Because I had a thing on my thing saying two members of the public wanted to comment. Maybe they dropped off. There's nobody else. Nobody else. Okay. Let me just ask again. Is there any, anyone else in the public have a comment? All Mike, right. If you, if you wanted to, if for some reason they're having a microphone issue, I don't really want to open a can of worms, but you could possibly do it through the Q&A. Okay. All right. I'm gonna, you know, again, people can come back with their comments if they're, when we get to another item, it'll still be okay. I'm, we're gonna be generous in, in terms of accepting public comments here because it is difficult to get a hold of us. We're not trying to, we're trying to make it easier, not harder for people to comment on anything that's on our agenda. So that, Alex, that was your, um, uh, the rider survey, the crisis report and the stuff from 909, uh, which became 12.5 uh, on our agenda. Um, Next, um, the, did John uh, Ergo have anything else that he wanted to add to these comments? John? Yeah, Mr. Chair, if you, if you would like John just to comment on the survey and ridership all in one, um, I think he could do that. Mike, uh, this is John uh, Leopold. Can I just yes. make one uh, uh, just a clarifying point of something that Alex said? Yes. Um, he ended the presentation uh, with talking about the stage uh, different stages as being connected to when the capacity limit would change. We have some information from the state that they may be changing the, the, from the stage system to a color-coded system. Mm. We don't exactly know what that means, but that they, they might be changing the way in which they, uh, they talk about um, opening up again. And so I just put that out as a caveat that, uh, that, that those markers could change over time. So that color system works better than the one after 9-11. That's what I was thinking too. And, and Mike, if, <laughs> as soon as that happens, I'll go back and revise that slide to the new one. Sure, that sounds great. All right, again, John, uh, Ergo, do you have anything else you'd like to add? Yeah, so I have about 12 slides that go into more detail on the survey. Uh, if you want to go through those or... Let's do it. I think we want to be well informed about what's going on. Okay. Perfect. So the... the and I'll tie in the quarter four ridership results because that, or uh, ridership report, because that's what set the stage for, for doing the survey. Um, so through quarter four of uh, FY20, ridership was down 91%. Um, and you can just hold on there. I'll, I'll tell you when to go to the next slide. Uh, local ridership, so non-student ridership is down about 75%. Um, so about 25% of uh, customers on our local routes are still riding. So essential workers, uh, people needing to travel to access essential services. 
the largest decrease is obviously in UCSC, Cabrillo, and student ridership, and also Highway 17. And the, the data that I've showed uh, is somewhat encouraging. We're seeing a slight increase in ridership, but we're still at about 90%, maybe 89% down. So ridership is pretty much stuck at that level uh, through the summer. Um, and so this, this survey was an effort to uh, get at the reasons why, besides the obvious of, you know, vast sectors of the economy being shut down, people working from home, um, and to uh, really develop strategies for uh, that Metro can take to encourage riders to return um, ride more frequently in the future. So next slide, please. So again, the objectives uh, we wanted to, I gave a preview of this in June. Uh, since then, we, we really delved into the data. Um, again, evaluate attitudes, likelihood of returning, and the effectiveness of strategies uh, the Metro can take. Next slide, please. The survey was distributed in English and Spanish to about 3,000 Metro email subscribers on two occasions uh, between June 10th and June 26th. We received about 250 responses, so about a 10% response rate on that uh, email subscriber list, which is pretty good. Um, next slide, please. And in general, 75% of uh, riders responded that they would uh, likely return to Metro once the shelter in place order is lifted. And we sent this in June and the meaning of the shelter in place order, I think has somewhat changed it. It's less of a definitive moment now to a gradual uh, release of restrictions, but still it's encouraging that 75% of riders said they would return. Of course, on the flip side, that means 25% may be unlikely to return. Next slide, please. Most uh, riders plan to ride the same as as before, so about two thirds, which is also encouraging. 17% stated they would ride more often uh, and 17% said they would ride less. Less encouraging was 20% of frequent riders, uh, those that ride five, or five days or more per week, said they would ride less. And those riders account, it's a small, smaller group, but they account for a larger share of Metro's ridership. So that would be a discouraging finding. Next slide, please. The primary concerns uh, among all customers were related to physical, physical distancing and vehicle cleanliness. Um, you can see we, we broke it down between those frequent riders and uh, riders who stated they were unlikely to return. Um, the top three reasons, or the top two reasons were the same amongst all, although unlikely riders uh, found that they would probably switch to more auto modes. Drive, they felt driving their car was faster. Um, and frequent riders were more likely to be laid off or unemployed. Next slide, please. Um, even though most riders said they plan to return, we do expect ridership is gonna rebound pretty slowly. So uh, in terms of timing, 40% uh, of all those surveyed said they would come back once uh, shelter in place is lifted. Um, so we can expect at least a 60% decrease until that time, of course, we're at 90% driven largely by the lack of uh, school term service. Um, but there'll be a gradual coming back outside of that. Uh, riders indicated they would come back a month to a year to sometimes next year. 17% said they would not come back until there was a treatment or a vaccine. And so that's just an unknown time period where we can expect a, that ridership loss and 17% said they just weren't sure. So next slide, please. So in general, in, in the short to medium term, uh, again, we can expect that 50 to 60% uh, ridership to be down 50 to 60% as riders wait for schools in the economy to reopen and a certain percentage wait for the development of a treatment and vaccine. Long-term ridership loss could be as high as 25%. So that cohort that said, you know, we may never return. And the primary driving factors are concerns about the perception of safety um, and uh, concerns related to physical distancing, vehicle cleanliness, and less external factors related to the economy or classes moving online. And so this really suggests that through cleaning and bringing service back, there are specific measures Metro can take. And so the next slide of questions, next slide, please, is where we delved into the effectiveness of those strategies. Among all riders, service improvements ranked as the most important, so very important or important. 77% um, of frequent riders just wanted to see service come back. Uh, 
and 70% of even unlikely riders with the maintenance of COVID-19 specific measures, technology enhancements and infrastructure improvements ranking as less important. Next slide, please. Uh, and we, we then segmented our, our responses among frequent riders, again, those riding five or more days per week, uh, riders planning to ride less and unlikely riders. And so among frequent riders, these customers care, more, care most about service quality. Um, so they wanna see vehicle cleanliness, service restoration uh, to pre-COVID-19 levels were the top two um, ranked responses. Uh, and then you can see a requirement of PPE. Uh, interestingly, observing social distancing, limiting vehicle capacity was still important, but ranked towards the bottom. Um, and none, none of them really, not many cared about continuing the free or reduced fare period that we had in the beginning. Next slide, please. We asked riders planning to ride less what we could encourage them to do to ride more in the future. And these, these customers were more concerned about safety. So they're more concerned about the, exi the existence of a vaccine, uh, requiring PPE, kind of this perception of safety while, while onboard metro vehicles. Also concerned about clean, cleanliness and sanitization um, and less concerned about restoring service to pre-COVID-19 levels. So that ranked all the way at the bottom. It's, it was not a major driver for, the, for encouraging these riders to, to ride more in the future. Next slide, please. And finally, for customers planning to, or not planning to ride in the future, um, again, the existence of a treatment or vaccine and seeing a significant decrease in new COVID-19 cases were the top two ranked responses and also vehicle cleanliness. Um, you know, these, these top two concerns are not things that are within Metro's control. And so it, it could be a while before we see this, you know, 15, to 20% of riders that said they were unlikely to return uh, before we see them coming back. So I think final slide, please. So given all that, we're recommending uh, focusing our immediate efforts on trying to encourage frequent riders to come back. So they're a smaller group that comprise a larger share of overall ridership. And their primary concerns are our measures that are directly within Metro's control, restoring service to pre-COVID-19 levels, which we're doing. So starting with the fall bid, as Alex mentioned, we're, we're pretty much ramping back up to 100% of local service, uh, minus school term service and reduced, a reduced Highway 17 schedule. We'll be about, it'll be about 25% less service overall uh, compared to last fall. Um, and they're also concerned about vehicle cleanliness and requiring PPE on the board. Again, concerned about uh, service quality and measures that Metro can take. Once we do that, we think future efforts should, should be focused more on motivating riders that are planning to ride less and those unlikely riders, because they are generally concerned about things that, that are beyond Metro's control. So the development of vaccine and a decrease in new COVID-19 cases. All customers ranked cleaning as important to them. Uh, and Alex went through all the measures that were taken to do that. Another important aspect related to that is publicizing that and making sure that customers are seeing that we're doing that. And Danielle has developed uh, the advertisement campaigns related to that. And we also just see the, the cleaners at the, at the metro stations, uh, boarding buses after each run. That, that said, I'd be happy to delve into it or take any additional questions on it, but it was a, it was a useful exercise to go through to develop strategies for, for combating this rider loss. I see James Sandoval has a comment. Go ahead, James. So I just wanted to confirm the primary reason passengers are not riding right now is because they're concerned about social distancing. Okay, thanks for the comment. Are there questions or comments uh, from any other board members or members of the public? Well, just, and I think another re reason is so many people working from home. Yeah, thirty percent. So they well, my my question was a confirmation. That, that was a real question. I just didn't know if I missed that slide. I, I saw forty two percent, but I didn't know if it was. Uh, the question was why wouldn't you ride right now? So I just wanted to confirm that. The question was what are the primary reasons you would be unlikely to ride? And concern about social distancing was the primary concern. Interestingly, on the flip side, when we asked 
what would encourage you to ride again and more in the future, decreasing capacity ranked towards the bottom. So there was a disconnect between the concern and the measure. Um, customers were more interested in seeing service restoration uh, and PPE and cleaning than uh, limiting capacity on board buses. Thank you. Thanks. Anyone else? Okay. Oh, sorry, Trina, go ahead. Um, yes, can you, can you tell us a little bit about the data overlay since the majority of our bus services are our students and that's really been what's closed off the most. Do we have any idea how many of these results were from students that aren't writing because school is closed? Uh, we do, we did ask some uh, socio-demographic data, so we do know which uh, respondents indicated there were students or not. I didn't break the data down that way. Um, you know, the list, the survey was sent to our email subscribers, um, but we can do a further analysis based on that would be interesting. If you wouldn't mind at some point sending us that an email with whatever you find when you break that down, that would be good, I think. Yeah. Thank you. Anyone else? Yes. Cynthia Matthews. Yeah. Um, when you get that data, it'd be good to see. And if you could send us your PowerPoint slides too, that'd be great. You're yep. talking about Alex, I think, as well as John Ergo from that. All right. I'm going to move on. Uh, Alex, you, I don't know if you've done your, you, your, you have additional oral report for us? Um, oh, Mike, I think Aurelio wanted to get the floor. Okay, sorry, I didn't catch that. Aurelio, go ahead. You have to unmute. Hey, sir. Yeah, I raised my little blue hand and I raised my physical hand. <laughs> uh, there's a lot of us out here. Uh, yeah, I have, a, I have a question on your survey. Um, you indicated something about the vehicle, they would prefer riding their vehicles. I, I guess it's a twofold question I go um, has our times increased in our bus uh, routes our, no was have they improved off highway one since there's less traffic yes I don't believe that our schedules are capturing that again we don't have automatic vehicle locator uh, installed yet but certainly with the reduction in traffic travel times have probably improved but we have not we have not been able to adjust our schedules uh, because we don't have that information that data that comes in. I, I think that'd be kind of uh, yeah go good to capture because I mean if, if and when the auxiliary lanes do come into effect, that might be reflective of the time that we're going to be able to provide for for services mm -hmm. uh, to persuade those folks that once traffic does return back to its normal, uh, that you know we have a, a, there's we can show them hard fact numbers you know. Yeah, incidentally, peak period traffic is approaching normal. So traffic has returned, even though travel has perhaps not quite as returned. Interesting. Did you, did you have a comment? Just made some noise, I guess. Okay. Anyone else? Going once, going twice. All right, Alex, do you have additional uh, general comments? Uh, not under that one. I have the CEO oral report under number 15, if you're ready for that. Yeah. Go ahead for that. Okay. And if we could bring that up on the screen. Next slide, please. So I'm going to just roll through a couple of slides and explain them real quickly, but uh, there are some slides in here uh, reflective of our fire response um, on the, vir virtually the next day after the fire, the CZU fire um, hit, we reached out that morning to uh, CAL FIRE and said, hey, we see that you're, uh, you're exploding at the seams over here at Sky Park. Um, we have this transit center that is in this particular COVID environment is underutilized. Would you be interested in that? And we also have this vacant building that you could use for logistics. By that afternoon, they called back and they said, yeah, can you bring us the key? So we, um, we met them out there, we gave them the key, we explained uh, just our part of it, that it's still a live transit terminal and we're gonna be bringing buses through there. So we, we just need them to not bother the bus lane 
but what they do with the building and what they do with the parking lot is up to them. We, we, we relinquished full control over to them. <clears throat> We're still catching up on the paperwork part of that, but uh, this was an emergency and we wanted to help out. In addition to that, Rufus reached out to uh, the Office of Emergency Services and said, hey, we're ready, willing, and able to help evacuate, just let us know. Um, that resulted in us putting uh, uh, at least a fixed route in a paracruise vehicle out in, um, it's either Ben Loman or Felton, James would know better than I, or Daniel. Um, and I think these pictures come from that first night. Uh, and, then, and then what happened is over, as the fire continued, we progressed to a strategy where we were staged at um, the Scotts Valley Transit Center and primarily using the paratransit vehicles. <clears throat> and the strategy there is the paratransit vehicles are much more nimble. They can get up into those tighter areas up in Ben Lomond and Boulder Creek and Felton. Um, so we did a number of uh, um, pieces of work for Cal Fire and we're really, really proud of our, our staff for doing that. Can you go to the next slide, please? I don't think these are in order. I believe this is that first night too. Next slide. Um, so this, this is interesting. They're, they're a little out of sync, but it's very rare that you see our bus yard look like this. So here's the thing. So, so last week when um, there was an evacuation order up the street here on Highway 9 at Paradise Park, um, Margo and Anna Marie and I started talking about, well, we should do the right thing here, um, as we've been trained to do for floods, earthquakes, um, tornadoes, whatever, right? Uh, and that is protect your equipment. Um, so we, we talked about, well, you know, this, it could, they, they could evacuate us. The fire could come down Highway 9. They could evacuate us. We weren't even at a warning stage, but we thought, well, let, let's get ahead of this because here's the thing. Um, if, if something like that happened, it could happen overnight. Um, and that could be a problem to move a lot of equipment overnight. So we thought, well, we'll get ahead of this. We'll field, we'll field the buses and we'll disperse them throughout the county so that they're placed in strategic locations in the event <clears throat> that we move to a warning and then ultimately to evacuation in this area around Vernon and JKS. Um, so we dispersed buses to Capitola Mall, to the Metro Center, to the SoCal Park and Ride. And uh, that, the result of that is a pretty darn empty lot for a few days until we felt comfortable bringing the equipment back. Next slide. Same thing, next slide. Um, evacuation equipment, next slide. And there we are staged. Uh, I think this is either night one or two because um, we were still using a fixed route bus at that point. Next slide. There's our, our proud Paracruise drivers. They're staged. This was uh, this past Friday. Um, so I came over to the transit center on Friday and, and uh, had a chat with these folks. They were really proud of what they were doing and, um, and telling me a few of their stories. And, and uh, so they were happy to stand for a pose. Next slide. And this, this is a slide of a, a customer, a very happy uh, evacuee that, that we helped out. Next slide. Uh, looking out at the transit center parking lot uh, this past Friday, um, this, and that, remember, that's the day that uh, Scotts Valley had to evacuate. Um, there's, you can see some fire equipment there in the distant. Next slide. Uh, this shows you, uh, when we took the buses out of the yard and dispersed them, this is what it looked like at Metro Center. Um, we were packing them in wherever we, wherever we could. Next slide. Same thing. Look at them. They're, they're in like sardines at this point. Um, but we were doing everything we could to try to ensure that if we got evacuated in this area, we could provide some level of service. Next slide. And uh, moving on to another topic. Uh, next slide. This is the <coughs> fire egress. Um, our golf building, for whatever reason, on that second story, um, only has one way into that uh, office uh, part of that second story and one way out. Um, and we've identified a couple of years ago that we need to have a second um, ingress egress. Um, so we found the money finally, we, we went out to bid and as we speak, it's under construction. Next slide. Next slide. Okay. And then the, there was only going to be one other slide, but I, I didn't get it in there. Uh, I wanted to show you that even during COVID crisis, we're getting things done. Um, the new roof on golf, the maintenance facility is done. 
it's uh, quite a spectacular roof. I think it'll last us a long time and uh, it has been completed. Next, I will go on to uh, new hires, which is a, a senior accounting technician in the way of Simone Koch. And then you already met Danielle, our marketing communications and customer service director. And then a very quick state and federal update. Um, we're working through CTA, uh, California Transit Association, which we're a member of, and I'm, I'm on the executive committee of, to try to get the state to be interested in providing some funding to transit agencies for operation. Unfortunately, the legislature uh, on August 31st will recess. And so when they come back into session, that'll be high on our topics to talk to them about. Um, we've been working successfully with them and the legislature through the year uh, or the last several months in the COVID environment to get more flexibility of funding that we already have and to get fare box relief on the TDA. Um, CTA, California Transit Association is also um, working at a federal level <clears throat> to encourage that if there is a CARES Act II, whatever that ultimate number is, that California gets three billion, with a B, three billion dollars uh, for transit. On the federal side, um, CARES Act II, the discussion about that seems to um, have been put on the back burner. <clears throat> Speaker Pelosi indicated to the White House that she was willing to talk about the HEROES Act, uh, but the president has said, uh, no, uh, the problem is um, we're too far apart. He wants to try to keep the overall package at one trillion. So when they're still fighting about one trillion versus three and a half trillion, um, they're not at any stage where they're talking about a lot of detail of the subcomponents of the package of which a CARES Act program might be. Um, so our best hope is that we get some sort of additional CARES money, maybe a phase two of CARES money in a continuing resolution. Remember, the uh, FAST Act expires here in another month or two. They're going to have to have a continuing resolution because they're not going to get to reauthorization before the election and, 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 the, and, and the new year. So there'll be a continuing resolution, and that might be one place to try to insert into that continuing resolution. And a continuing resolution allows them to keep funding the various programs in the FAST Act at the authorized FAST Act levels. So that's important to us so we can pay our bills. And maybe in that bill, there can be something for a CARES Act too. That's where we'll turn a lot of our attention. Um, and then finally on the House infrastructure, what was known as the Invest in America Act, 1.5 trillion with a T, um, uh, uh, an incredible package would have, would have brought a lot of capital dollars to our agency. Um, it's just not moving at this time. The Senate has no interest in talking about that. So if it comes back alive, it'll be after the new year. And Mr. Chair, uh, that concludes my presentation under the CEO oral report. Thank you, Alex. Our next item, number 16, is about, um, we're looking for public comments on the Metro's proposed disadvantaged business enterprise, or DBE, uh, goal of 2.65%. For members of the public who might want to know why is that such a low number. Um, this was a program that was set up to try and encourage the use of mainly uh, minority owned or uh, businesses owned by people of color or other disadvantaged groups. And it, it's based on what the percentages of businesses of that type owned by, for example, minority owned businesses in your, in your service area. And we have a very low percentage. So therefore the, the number that we're expected, the, this is a minimum. You must, must have at least 2.5% of your organizations, either the subs or the main organization when you hire for a contract of some kind that they come on. And because we have such a low percentage of such actual businesses in our community, we have a very low requirement to meet that. And Angela will tell us more about that reality. Angela, it's up to you. You're, you're muted somehow, Angela. Angela, you're still muted. I don't know why. It doesn't show you're muted, but you are. Something wrong with your mic or whatever. Nope, not yet. Take a moment there. Now, okay, now I can unmute you. You did. You're good. Try it now. No. Um, Angela, if you if you want to come in here, I'll uh, move more than six feet away, and you can take over this computer. Okay. She's on the move. She's left the forest or wherever she was over there, and she's. <laughs> 
And, and Mike, do you want to do you want to open the public hearing after Angela's initial presentation, or I'm yes. not sure. Well, actually, let me formally open the public hearing, and we'll start with a report from Angela about the proposal. There we go, here she comes. What I was saying is that Mike did such a good job. Are there any questions? <laughs> okay, sorry. <laughs> okay, so um, as Mike said, this is uh, 2.65 is our goal that we're looking for. We do this every three years now instead of only once a year. Um, we have done the uh, publishing that is required to the Sentinel and to the Pajaronian. We did that in July. We also did two public outreach meetings and um, we're offering a, a public hearing today. We have not received any uh, public comments to my knowledge as of now, but if people can offer public comments here at this meeting and the goal must be submitted by October 1st, that's why we need uh, adoption today. We'll take the month of September to make sure we have all our dot, I's dotted and T's crossed before we submit in October. So with that, we can move forward. Are there any questions about this item? Of course, this agency would love to have, see a higher percentage of uh, disadvantaged business enterprises involved in our various contracts, but that's the, uh, we're now uh, debating, or not debating, but uh, deciding on whether the min the absolute minimum we have to meet. Any right. other comments? I'm looking for a motion then to approve this, and then we'll put it in front of the public. Do I have a motion to- I move the recommended- we'll move the item. Motion by Donna Meyer, second by John Leopold. Second. So now let me ask, are, are there members of the public who would like to comment on this proposed uh, percentage? I see none. I'm gonna wait a moment. Ed, do you have a comment? No, I just came ready to vote. Okay, <laughs> then I'll have a roll call vote, please, Gina. So I have one more thing. Gina just pointed out to me that uh, at the conclusion of the public review that we did in the comment period, we did receive four requests from the public for information regarding the development of how we came up with the goal, which we did answer. And then we had two comments about the goal setting methodology. So um, again, it was just comments and questions that we didn't answer. So there's nothing outstanding at this point. I mean, just so the public understand, when we first did this, and this was decades ago, uh, and it was part of a federal process and we were expecting, you know, 30 numbers of like 30% or something. And it just was not realistic because there just are not that many minority owned firms in, the, in Santa Cruz County that do the kind of projects that we would put out to bid or out to uh, RFPs. So point of order, Mike, can you close the public hearing before the vote? Yes, we will now close the public hearing and uh, yep. we have a motion and a second and uh, we're looking for a roll call. Sorry, I was busy looking up the um, public comment number. I missed who did the motion and who did the second. Motion was made by um, Ed. No, Donna Myers. Uh, Donna Myers and seconded by John Leopold. I'm sorry, say that again? Set, made by Donna Myers and seconded mm -hmm. by John Leopold. Thank you. Okay, now the roll call. Okay. Director Botsworth? Aye. Director Kaufman Gomez? Yes. Director Gonzalez? Aye. Director Leopold? Aye. Dr. Lind? Aye. Dr. Matthews? Aye. Dr. McPherson? Aye. Dr. Myers? Aye. Dr. Pegler? You may be muted there. Larry, you there? I don't see. Yes, my, my network went down. I'm back. You're looking for your vote on the motion to prove the uh, DBE uh, percentage. Affirmative, please. Thank you. Um, Director Rothwell, I believe you've joined Hi. us. Thank you. Yeah, I, I had a, a disconnection until 45 minutes into the proceeding. Okay. So sorry about that. Thank you. And Director Rotkin. Aye. Unanimous. 
unanimous vote. Thank you, that it's approved. Uh, next, we have an oral Paracruz update uh, from Daniel Zaragoza. Good morning, directors. Um, we're, we have uh, Ken Hart from Swift Consulting Services. Um, he will be giving you an update on this item. Thank you, Ken, go ahead. Make sure you're unmuted. Okay, good morning, can you hear me? Yes, we can, thanks, Ken. Thank you. Now, this is Ken Hart with Swift Consulting and we've been retained by the district to coordinate the design team and manage the permit process for the district's Paracruz project. And as you probably know, the project would consist of a construction of a 5,000 square foot, approximate 5,000 square foot admin uh, office and uh, moving the Paracruz operation to the park and ride lot owned by the district at the uh, Paul Sweet and SoCal Drive intersection. The project requires that the county approve a master site plan, and this would be uh, something that the Planning Commission would be considering. We did hold a public meeting to discuss the very conceptual um, plans that we have at this point on Tuesday, August 11th. Um, this was a preliminary meeting, and once we have developed plans and in advance of a permit application uh, to the county, we will conduct another public hearing with the, the detailed plans. And our, our goal is to make the application with the county for the master site plan in mid-January. And that permit process is anticipated to take between five and six months to complete. And the district also expects to make application for FTA grant funds in uh, February or March of 2021. And according to the funding agency, grant awards will be made in September of 2021. Uh, FTA expects grant funded projects to be constructed within three years of the grant award. And once awarded, the design team that we've, we will have assembled will prepare the construction drawings and documents to support an application for a building permit with the county. Uh, the plan preparation and the building permit issuance um, process is anticipated to take between seven and nine months, which would leave about two and a half years to complete the construction of the project. That's a really high level overview of the, of the project and the, um, the schedule. And I'm available to answer any questions if you have, if you have them. My, my understanding is that that first meeting, perhaps rare for Santa Cruz County, most of the neighbors and others that came were kind of happy to see us developing that property rather than leaving it in its current state. Is that correct? Well, yeah, Daniel, you can jump in. But yes, there was um, some of the neighbors were very happy that uh, a security guard now uh, patrols the, the area on occasion. I don't know how often they do that, but um, they're, they're happy to see that property developed um, and uh, you know, that it not be, you know, just unattended, if you will. Yes, thank you. Any other I, I, attend, I attended that meeting as well. And I think they were also happy with the thoughtfulness that was put into where the buildings would go. It's only one story where the bus, where the vans would go. I think that the, that uh, we didn't have a lot of people on there, but, but they seemed uh, very interested in the fact that they thought it was a well-designed uh, piece. Thanks, John. Any other comments or questions? This doesn't require any action on our part. Thank you for the report. Appreciate it. Uh, next, Angela will give us an update on our key performance indicators. Take it away, Angela. So this is a new report that we've put together. We're gonna to try to do it every quarter for you. And it's gonna be an evolving report. This is just a, um, a start. We plan on having a lot more information as the years go, as the months go by. But uh, um, I think most people know what KPIs are, K, uh, key performance indicators. And these are things that uh, different departments measure to see how their departments are doing and then how the agency as a whole is doing. So we have uh, ones for financial performance, which I'll be going over. We have ridership ones, which uh, John, our planning director will be going over. We have safety ones that our safety director will be going over fleet maintenance ones that our uh, fleet maintenance manager will be going over. And then we also have service delivery ones that our Margaret or our COO will be going over. 
So if we can bring up the slides for those different, um, different charts. Here we go. So the first one here is a system fare box recovery ratio. And as you can see, the green is 2018 and you go all the way over to the gold is FY20. And you can see exactly when uh, we shut down taking uh, fares into our fare boxes in the middle of March. And then it stayed um, next to nothing ever since then. And then you have the average, and then you can also see the average that's come down um, in the last few months also. Um, fare box recovery, we want to stay, I believe under 25% is, is the number that we want to stay under. And you can see where we went over it a couple of times at 26%, but overall we're under the 25%. So the next slide. Fiscal performance. So these are two different ones. One is for fixed route along with Highway 17 and the second one is for pair cruise uh, cost per trip. The first one shows you, um, this is also FY18, which is the pink all the way through FY20, which is the uh, blue. And you can see that uh, depending on the month, it also depends on how much these uh, routes cost. So July of last year, it was $450. And then June of this year, it was also 401. But during the year, you can see how it came down. Fair cruise cost per trip, similar stuff. FY18 is the pink, all the way to FY20 is the blue. And you can see, depending on the month, how much those trips cost per month. What accounts for the huge and relatively large numbers at the, you know, the July, June, summer periods? I'll defer that question to Daniel. Yes, it, 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 it is really um, the low ridership. We, we have the same uh, amount of operators, but our ridership has been extremely low. So what that does, it, it creates a higher cost per ride. Thank you. That makes sense. And it looks like you can see the same for fixed route, very yeah, similar. That too. Okay, moving on to the next slide. I'll let John take that. Okay. Uh, the top is ridership per revenue hour as a measure of passenger productivity. You can see that it, it dipped a lot in April, May, and June for reasons we've been discussing throughout this meeting and then total ridership it's on the bottom. Uh, next slide. And then here it's broken down by Highway 17, UCSC, Cabrillo, and local ridership. Um, and again, the biggest decreases uh, during April, May, and June were on Highway 17. UCSC went pretty much down 100%, same with Cabrillo, uh, whereas local ridership has, has decreased about 75%, as we've discussed. Next slide. This uh, shows ridership by route, the 16, route 16 having the highest ridership, the most frequent serving UCSC. Um, going down through inner city highway 17 local and, and rural routes uh, having less ridership. Next slide. I don't know who's doing safety. This will be Rufus. Okay. Rufus, you're muted or Okay, we'll move on to the next one. Come back if you can. Fleet maintenance, Eddie. Yes, on ours, it's mean distance between road calls. Basically what that is, is how reliable our vehicle is between our maintenance PM program and what the distance it travels between uh, mechanical failures. Basically, if you look at it uh, in between uh, July and February, right around our COVID, you can see where it tapers off. Uh, we, we didn't run as many miles there. So, but 
I'm going to go over basically what we're doing to increase our miles between road calls. <coughs> basically, we're being proactive in our, instead of having a reactive program, we're changing that to a proactive program where we start to change these components out, such as engine transmissions and different things that's causing us problems on our road calls ahead of time. So that's that's one we're imagining the main distance between road call. And then you get into the other one, and that, uh, the uh, second slide is where uh, whether or not a bus can continue in service versus uh, having a problem and it just needs to be taken out of service altogether and brought back in. Okay, if we can uh, back up to the safety one, I have Rufus here. Um, oh, uh, yeah, I hope someone, uh, yeah, I was, he, uh, th that last slide we were just looking at was very hard to figure out exactly what was going on. Yeah, and it's great to have finish? a little bit more description yeah, we'll writing to know how to read that that chart. Let's hear from Rufus first, then we'll come back to that, John. Okay. Hi, everybody. Good morning. I think it's still morning. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's still, it's still, still <laughs> good morning. Good morning, directors and staff. Uh, as you can see on the, there are three portions of this report. One is with dealing with the traffic accidents and second is passenger accidents and third report will say incidents. So what traffic accidents, what we have done that we have uh, documented all the data for 2018, 19 and 20. So 20 has only two quarters, January, February, March and April, May, June. So the coding structure was developed based on the industry safe program, which the district has purchased sometime before my time. And we developed the coding structure to capture that information. And traffic accident collisions mean anything dealing with our buses when they are in the revenue service and those accidents, whether they take place in a intersection or on the street or at the bus stop, any collisions with our vehicles is coded in that coding structure. This has from coding 10 to 491 different types of accidents, which will be classified under traffic accident collisions. As you can see, this data represents uh, 2018 is pretty much good in a way that it is consistent. 2019 we have, as you can see, in the last quarter a rise. And in 2020, we have a significant drop there. You can see that in the second quarter. And as we were looking, because uh, our exposure was less, during that period because of COVID-19. Same thing we, we, we see on the passenger accidents, 2018, 2019, and 20. And below is, you can see 2018, 19, and 20 on incidents. Can I go back on, on passenger accidents? That's something perhaps somebody trips on the bus and falls in the aisle or something that would be a, tra a passenger accident? Yes, that will be whether they were trying to board the bus, whether they were inside the bus and they slip or trip, or whether they were getting off the bus and, and they got injured. So anything dealing with the passengers during this process of getting onto the bus or being in the bus or getting off the bus. And the coding structure for that is from 500 to 681. All different types of accidents pertaining to a passenger have been coded in there. And this is the program industry safe is being used with, by many transit systems uh, throughout California. Could, could you give us some idea of how we might compare with other agencies? It seems like a large number of traffic accidents, but I, I don't know how to, you know, what, what goes on in the industry. I mean, some of these are minor fender benders or something, but could you give us some idea of how we're compared to other agencies? With yeah, we can do that. There is an NTD report, National Transit Database. And we supply pretty much same information to, uh, to the FTA 
Federal Transit Administration through NTD, and we can request uh, comparable transit systems or people or, or the agencies which are in the same kind of environment uh, to get the data. Yeah, we can do that. If you could send that out to us at some point, that would be useful, I think, to the okay. board. Okay, I'll do that. Are there other questions or comments? I'm not seeing any. Okay, thank you for your report, Rufus. Thank you so much. Back to your question, John. Mike, Mike yes. I did Cynthia, please, go ahead. I was just curious, don't have to take a lot of time now, but what are the patterns of, um, the, I'm thinking in particular the passenger accidents. Is it um, people who are frail and not steady on their feet or mechanical things they trip on? What, I'm just curious and then obviously you want to know what you learned from that. So not to take a lot of time. Did you hear that question, Rufus? No, I, I missed uh, half, half of the bus. question. What, what, what kinds of accidents are, are passengers having on our buses? Are they frail people who, you know, have a hard time just generally uh, mo being mobile or tripping over things? Or is it when buses stop and start? What, what, what's the nature of the kinds of accidents we're having with passengers? The mostly which we have seen uh, are when they are getting onto the bus or they are in the bus and they're not holding to the uh, railings or stanchions, and sometimes they are getting off and they trip while they are getting off on the bus, uh, miss the step or something like that. And, and, and so the part of the question was, I think, are, do we have any kind of a program to figure out what we might do once we identify what kinds of things are happening, whether there might be something we can do to reduce those? those yeah, incidents? that's a very good uh, concern question. I was uh, talking about this thing, preparing a uh, a handout or brochure, uh, how to ride our system safely, how to wait for the bus when you are at the bus stop, how to get onto the bus safely, and while you are in the bus, how you can protect yourself and not to get hurt, and while you're getting off the bus, what things you should do uh, in order to be safely alighting on the bus. I'm preparing that brochure as an educational thing, which will be like take once in the buses we want to put those things. And I will be working with Danielle. I briefly talked to her on that one. So once that brochure is done, uh, yeah, that will help. That's definitely will help some of those kinds of in, uh, incidents. Cynthia has a follow up. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for that. And just, I would say that sounds like a good candidate for a video too. Oh, that's an excellent thing that can be done. <laughs> Almost more than but a brochure. <laughs> we, we will try our best, whatever yeah. we can do to educate our, our passengers, our customers, how to safely ride our system. Not, not to treat it lightly, but you know, one worries about them reading the pamphlet and tripping because they're not looking where they're going. <laughs> <laughs> they can read while they're sitting or <laughs> you're right. They should not be reading while they're getting onto the bus, right? Which is maybe they should start with that at the top. Don't read this while you're getting on the bus. <laughs> okay. okay. Any other questions, comments? Thank you very much. We appreciate Thank it. You. Now we're going to go uh, back to the question John Leopold had raised. John, you want to repeat? Oh, well, well, I was, uh, you know, the um, I was trying to follow what, what was being said, and I was looking at the um, the the colored bars on that chart and the FRs and the CMs. And it, it was just it was just very difficult for me to to really uh, completely understand what I should make from this um, chart. And I'm trying if we're going to be using it on a regular basis. I was hoping that we could just either get something a little bit more in writing about what those what the FRCMs and I forget what the last one was uh, mean, or just a little bit more explanation. And and if I'm the only one to um, well, that would be helpful. I think we understand that would be. Yeah, if we could put the slide back up, please. I think you're talking almost like the key to what the bars mean. Yeah. So I can see that it w it went down in, and during COVID, but I don't, you know, is green high good? Is I I, I, I just can't understand this chart. Let me let me let me try to go over the chart. Let's go to let's go to July. Let's start at July. The yeah. first the first part of the chart is the fixed route 
uh, mean distance between road calls. That's the distance that the bus travel on the, our average travel in our fleet on the, on the fixed route fleet without having any interruptions in the service from a mechanical standpoint. This, the second one is the, the uh, distance, the mean distance between road call that our commuter buses travel without having a mechanical uh, disruption and having to take the bus out of service. The third one would be our pair cruise, which would be the green one, which is the uh, distance that the unit traveled without having a mechanical uh, disruption that caused the unit to come out of service. So a higher bar then is, is better. The, the a higher bar, bar, that is correct. Okay. And, um, and so during, during the period of COVID, we just went less miles or the buses broke down more often? We more traveled much. less miles. That one indicates that we traveled less, mi less miles, not because the bus broke down more often, but we had a lot less miles traveled. Okay. All right. Thank you. Can I have a follow-up question just to look, clarify a little bit better? I, I can't yeah. tell who that is, but Aurelio, go ahead. Aurelio, sorry. Uh, it, Eddie, right? Ed? Yeah. Eddie. Eddie? Uh, you you were saying that if miles traveled, bef I mean the average miles traveled before they had a mechanical failure. Is that correct? Before we had a, me a mechanical failure that would cause the vehicle to disc that would interrupt interrupt the service that would so, cause so the vehicle to be taken out. So say in, no in November for the commuter, it traveled an average of fifty four thousand miles. Let's go to November. Is that 1,000 miles, right? Well, one second, let me go to your November. 54,000 miles, that's before, correct. Before we had a mechanical failure. On the, and, then it, on the, and then in December, it gave a huge back, back, drop back down to 16, I think it's 16, about 16,000. What, what's why, is, and then it peaked back up in January. Why, why is that big difference of mechanical failure? Right, let me go to your November. Let's go to the November chart. Look at the main distance, 54,481. Mm -hmm. And then when we go to, what was the other in December? Or? Yeah, you go between, the, between November, December, and January, you have a, yeah. you have a huge curve. And, and on, we had 18, on the uh, commuter, we had 18, uh, 612. Yeah. That one, I'll have to go back and look at the data. I'll, I'll go back and look at it and see what caused that different and drop, uh, being that that was, uh, at the time, uh, looked like a few months ago. I can go back and look at that and then give you an answer for that. Okay. We don't run much service in December is the answer to that question. The school service was, um, well that, actually, that's on the uh, commuter. That's over Highway 7. That's a commuter. Yeah, that's why I was asking that. Right. What, what was the I guess the holiday season, season and the San Jose State being closed for the holiday may be there, but we'll, we'll, we'll find out. Get back to us, Eddie, please. Okay. Mr. Chair, just to point out, um, as we introduce these slides, this is the kind of feedback and questions that we're looking for so that we can make the presentation better and better each time. Um, what I will say is, is as we get better at this, we'll come in more prepared to address any of the sort of anomalies that occur we should have those answers at our fingertip um, and we should discuss them in our pre-board meeting. Um, we'll also add in future slides, uh, uh, average, uh, a goal, and then we'll look at how we can take other agencies or peer agencies and give a comparison. Um, that can be a little tricky because this is current data. NTD data is a two-year lag, so we have to figure out how to deal with that to make it meaningful. Where our data measured against itself becomes more meaningful is, is the next iteration of this slide will show you past years. And if you focus on a decrease versus a past year, it begs the question, why is that occurring? And, and you start digging deeper to find out, is, is there some sort of thing that we're missing when we do our preventative maintenance? Do we have a, a fleet failure in the works, some kind of common thread? Um, so it helps you really begin to start, kind of focus on why your trend is going a particular way or not. I'm a little bit suspicious that maybe mileage um, 
factors in here only because I'm seeing those drops in March, April, May, and June, but we should know that issue too. Thank you. So uh, back to Angela, are there any other performance indicators we're gonna talk about today? Yeah, go on to the next slide, that'll be Margo. You're up. Margo, you got your hand up. Uh, there you go, there you go. Okay, okay, can I see the site? It went away, we had it for a moment. There, it's back now. Okay, so uh, as we can see that we had um, canceled trips um, due to various reasons. Um, usually it's lack of personnel or um, breakdowns. That's why it's kind of associated with the maintenance um, uh, key performance indicators, the miles between service calls. And um, so we had 41% of the inter incidents were due to traffic, likely um, Route 17 coming over, um, you know, coming over the hill. Um, and then it looks like in the last period, um, the majority of the canceled trips were over the weekend. Um, and during the AM and PM peak were smaller cancellations because we have um, more personnel to, to cover more service. Um, as, as, and does anyone have any questions? What, so what on the bottom uh, pie chart, weekend 74%, what, what causes um, canceling? trips on the weekend? Uh, usually um, lack of personnel. Uh, we, we don't have enough folks to um, cover the assignments. Okay. Yeah, Margo, I think we're missing that piece of data in the upper left-hand corner wheel because it doesn't account for, for uh, manpower. Uh, so that, that's one we need to go back and look at a little bit more. Okay. Uh, and um, certainly, I, I can help with uh, redoing the KPIs. Good. Okay. So our next one, the quarter, the next quarter, we'll get a one that's updated, giving us clear information about that. Yes. Jerry has a question or a comment. Yeah, my I wasn't sure, and and this may be part of the ongoing question. I'm not sure what passenger load would mean in this case. Why a trip might be canceled because of passenger load. Uh, that would be because of the stay at home order um, w where we didn't have enough um, okay. capacity. Okay, I think that helps. Just clarifying, so it means that because of our passenger limitation, that's, the, that's why? No, yes. it's driver. That looks like drivers. Uh, it wouldn't be a canceled trip. It would be a uh, we, we need to go back and check on that. Yeah, yeah master, well, it, it just doesn't, I don't know what the shelter in place order. I just, I, I'm trying to link, I'm trying to figure out what that means. Yeah, I, I don't, I should have caught that. I don't understand why a passenger load would lead to a ca canceled trip. So we'll get, we'll get a clarification on that too and make it much more clear in the next round of these. Yeah, I, I would say it's, it's great to have these and, and I appreciate that we're trying to figure out how to, how to read them and, and get the most information out of them. I think that's going to be helpful and it'll probably take a couple iterations before we, we find something that we look at and, and know uh, intuitively what's going on. Mm -hmm. Agreed. And, and even then, given the world we're in, uh, some of it will be baseline and some of it will be, you know, this week we have fires and this week the schools closed down. So. Sure. Okay. Sometimes like on a um, uh, financial report, you get the, um, the variances are called out in little sub notes. Yes. This is really hard to get the sense of. Angela, are there other uh, uh, performance, key, key, key performance? No, next slide is questions. So I think you guys have all your questions answered. Are there any other questions about the, the, uh, the entire report? Somebody's calling me. I don't know who that is. Okay. So uh, at last, we are. Uh, the review of items to be discussed in closed session. Julie Sherman's going to do that for us.
Mr. Chair, if I can interrupt, uh, you, you didn't ask for public comment on that item. Oh, I'm sorry. Were there public comments on uh, of any kind on the uh, key performance indicators? And I believe Nate has a question. Uh, I don't see his hand up. Nate, do you want to open your microphone? Um, I don't. He may not have a microphone. So Nate wants to know if the statistics include failures such as lift failure, or is this only vehicle mechan mechanical failures such as engine and transmission? And Eddie would have to be the one to answer that. I think Eddie had said this would be anything that stops them from proceeding with the ride. So a lift that doesn't work stops the bus cold, I think, and we have to replace it. Okay. All right. Eddie, are you nodding yes? That is correct. Uh, I had to unmute. I thought I was muted there. But yes, that is correct. Anything that stops that unit from making its trip without interruptions that is caused by a mechanical failure. That would be a lift. Okay. Julie, you're on. Thanks, Chair. Uh, we have two closed sessions today. They're both on an existing litigation matter. And I do not anticipate any reporting out after the closed session. Okay, um, I'll now announce that our next meeting, probably going to be on uh, Zoom as we've been doing, we'll see. <laughs> I'd be too optimistic to think we're gonna be meeting in person in September. Um, but that meeting is Friday, September 25th at nine o'clock in the morning. And it'll be again open to the public. Um, and uh, we'll let people know about that. We're not gonna come back out at, to, after closed session. This closed session is only open to members of the board and the executive staff. And we, um, you should have a separate email that came to you that has a different uh, uh, Zoom connecting number. So members of the board should, should have received that, should go find it. We're gonna- it's from Ian Barry. From Ian, thank you for that, John. And I'm gonna say we're gonna take, let's say about five minutes for people to, have, to find enough time to perhaps go to the restroom, which we haven't been able to do. And uh, we'll, we'll come back in about five minutes and we'll start our closed session for those of us that has access to that uh, account number. Thank you for the public. Thank you for everyone for your patience for this. Alex has another comment. Sorry, I just want to clarify uh, for the public. Um, they, uh, Gina is going to leave this part of the meeting open, although it will be muted. And then after we come back out of closed session, She'll make the formal announcement that there were no actions taken in closed session. And well, then I'll come, I'll come back for that. Yep. When you, we'll yep. that we'll come back then you'll that. adjourn. But, but we should all leave this meeting. Yes. Okay. Yes. Dan, Dan has a question. Dan has a comment or question. Dan, Dan has, has, has a hand up. Dan, go. Yeah, I won't be able to get back in unless you send it to me at my Gmail address. Um, everything's been going to my Cabrillo address, and that is disconnected. That's why I was 45 minutes late today. Um, so if I don't get a, a, a message uh, indicating the link to get back on, I won't be able to. So it has to go to my Gmail address, which is jdanrothwell at gmail.com. So say that again. Say that again. Gina, it's it's jdanrothwell at gmail.com. Thank you. Gina has it. She's going to send it right now, Dan. That's great. Thanks. Okay. Well, I'm going to thank the public and members of the board for your patience. It's uh, difficult to have these meetings this way. I do appreciate everybody's. We've had really good protocol on these meetings and people are really good about waiting to be recognized and so forth. And I don't want to take that for granted. It's a difficult time to pass through. And again, thanks to all of our uh, drivers and our uh, uh, staff members at the Metro. They've been doing heroic work around. I mean, we have so many crises facing us all at the same time. And I think they've done an amazing job of keeping this agency up and responding to it positively. I'm gonna call for a round of applause for all those folks. <laughs> doing this work. And now we can leave this meeting. I'll see you all in five minutes.
There's Gina. Okay, do we need anybody other than you and me, Gina? Do we don't need the attorney to announce that we have nothing to report from our closed session? Oh, she's back too. I'm here, but nothing to report. From our closed session. Thank you all. Everybody stay safe. You too. Bye-bye.